Okay, now it's recording. So now to the actual lecture series beyond the, the technical practicalities. Again, a very warm welcome. We're extremely glad and grateful that so many of you are here today. So what is this lecture series all about? So first, what this lecture series does is that it tries to highlight the diversity of approaches of researching, fighting, and communicating climate change and the pending climate crisis. This diversity of approaches um, is also represented in our speaker list, as you can see. And while the lecture series, of course, includes a lot of different academic speakers from different universities and from different disciplines, it also provides a stage for uh, speakers from civil society organizations, from social and environmental justice movements, as well as for practitioners, artists, and journalists. This choice of having such a broad array of different speakers is indebted to our conviction that for understanding and also for tackling the climate crisis, we need to bring natural scientists, social scientists, activists, artists, politicians, and many other stakeholders together. Yet what we also think is that climate science, but also the climate change discourse as such, is in many regards sometimes far too abstract. You know, it's all about the quantification of emissions, of the reducing of emissions. And what we want to do here through this lecture series is to make climate change uh, more understandable, so to say, and also that um, to focus maybe on, on, on some um, approaches of, um, of granular research on the social, cultural and political implications and consequences of climate change. And in line with that, we're especially happy that this lecture series is hosted by the Department of Social and Cultural Anthropology as this signalizes for us that, that more and more social scientists are willing to play a role um, in dealing with issues such as climate change, the Anthropocene, or more, more broadly spoken, the socio-ecological crisis. And with no further ado, we are happy to have uh, two wonderful guests here right at the beginning, two speakers to start this lecture series. And one of them is Professor Dr. Peter Schweitzer. He's the deputy head of the social and cultural anthropology department at the University of Vienna. He will welcome us and he will also introduce our first uh, keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Thomas Hulland Eriksson from Norway. And after the lecture, we will have some time for questions and then we will continue to hear from the Climate Walk Project. And in the end, we will introduce you to the course modalities and talk to you about how you can get your ECTS for this course. After a short break, um, we'll go straight into the panel discussion with some exciting guests that will join us later today. I have the great pleasure now to introduce you to Professor Peter Schweitzer. Professor Peter Schweitzer studied philosophy, political science, and social and cultural anthropology at the University of Vienna. Since 2012, he has been a full professor at the Department of Social and Cultural Anthropology at the University of Vienna after 20 years at the University of Fairbanks, Alaska. Professor Schweitzer is past president of the International Arctic Social Sciences Association and past chair of the Social and Human Sciences Working Group at the International Arctic Science Committee. His research areas include climate change, anthropology of the built environment, mobilities and remote areas, with a regional focus on the Arctic, subarctic and the former Soviet Union. Thank you very much for being here today, Peter, and also for supporting the Climate Walk project since its very beginning. We are looking forward to your, to your welcoming words. The online stage is yours. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you very much, Ria, for the introduction and really for all the organization that you have done so far. That's just wonderful, just how you have been, what you have been org organizing so far. And um, as um, from, from the department's perspective, you know, I can only be very proud of such students. Um, I'm also happy just because of what this lecture series constitutes, what its topic is, you know, climate change, as we just heard, and other other forms of, uh, of environmental change tied to the Anthropocene in one way or the other. But also, it's, it's, it is not limited to academia in the narrow sense. It's, um, as Martin already indicated, there is clearly, you know, the whole activity itself, you know, behind that is that, is that organization Climate Walk that, you know, as the name already says, is, is more than just talking about 
climate change. It's walking against climate change. And, and uh, uh, so there is, there is a, a level of, of activism clearly involved here and a, a, very, a very fresh, uh, useful level of activism that is very, very pleasant to experience. So, um, and, and finally, from, an, from a departmental perspective, um, what I'm, I'm most happy about is that this is a bottom-up um, initiative. It's not that any one of us professors or department chairs or anyone told you, you must do something. You better do something about climate change or against climate change. Not at all. It is all self-organized. Um, so we are just happy to, to, to help you um, administratively as much as we can, but really all the hard work is being done by you not only does that makes our make our lives easier but but it's really how it should be you know the ideas and the initiatives come sh should come from you and then then great things can happen so i'm very much looking forward to this series of lectures and it's really my great pleasure um, to introduce our first speaker and uh, what promises to be a really a wonderful start uh, to this um, to this uh, series called climate change through the lens of an inter and transdisciplinary project. So those of you who are anthropologists, um, I should not have to spend a single word about introducing Professor Thomas Hulland Erickson. I think um, if you are an anthropologist by education and do not know Professor Erickson, then go back to start. Um, because uh, because um, I think Thomas has, has really in the last 30, 35 years, uh, just uh, done tremendously much uh, for this discipline. And not just again in the narrow disciplinary sense, which he also has done, you know, he has led an, a variety of really important academic projects. Um, um, one, of the, one of the latest ones that I'm aware is, is this uh, project overheating, just based on an on ERC advance grant. Um, where, we, where there are many of you hopefully know the book overheating that is a result of that, which deals with a number of these issues that that this lecture series is about. But it's um, but Thomas never really uh, was limited himself uh, to the narrow academic um, field. He always was one of our best communicators, one of the best communicators within the discipline. Somebody who was able to 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 communicate the importance of anthropology to a broader audience. And I think this is a, is a rare gift. And I think we would more such people as Thomas in that respect. Um, so again, without really further ado, you know, I, once again, I think I, I could go on and, and, and list um, all the important uh, things that he has done and written. Um, just sufficient to say maybe that currently is professor of social anthropology at the University of Oslo. Um, and um, by the way, he has re is received very many um, um, kind of, um, he has been honored many times, especially also in that regard, in this communication, this outreach um, field of, of science and in, in communi communicating and anthropology. But again, uh, I don't want to keep you waiting any longer. Uh, without further ado, please help me welcome Professor Thomas Hulland Eriksson. Please, Thomas, the floor is yours. Thanks very much indeed, Peter. Thank you very much for your generous words. And, uh, and I should also thank the students for, for having taken this initiative, which is, which is fantastic. I mean, which uh, combines so many of our concerns. It's interdisciplinary, it reaches out, it is, you know, a, a way of combining knowledge with activism uh, at a time when this kind of engagement is really needed. So, um, so congratulations on the initiative and congratulations, Peter, for having such wonderful students at your department. And we have wonderful students as well, but they haven't started the climate walk yet. Maybe they will. So uh, I know that Peter has to go. He's also at a conference in Halle, but um, we shall move on. And uh, what I'm going to do uh, for about half an hour is really to to try to say something about the way in which anthropology and the way in which we see the world and in the way in which we position ourselves as human beings in the world has changed and is changing. It is, no, it is not, as it were, um, newsworthy to say that, uh, to point out that in fact, uh, 
anthropology has always been informed and inspired by events outside. I mean, think of the pandemic for, for, for an example from the last year, which has led to a wide range of anthropological engagement, many of them online and very many of them experimental, interestingly, regarding methodology, because we can't, I mean, you can't go to the Seychelles anymore. So you have to find ways of uh, doing your work online. And uh, this has also led to the generation of a lot of new knowledge online through sort of dynamic uh, new platforms. Or think of the Syrian refugee crisis five, six years ago, which also led to a number of important insights and a number of important research projects. The considerable interest in ethnicity and nationalism towards the end of the last century, from the early 1980s onwards, which hadn't really been on the agenda before in the social sciences, suddenly it was all over the place, not least in anthropology. Uh, no coincidence at all, because it was a time with a, uh, it was a beginning of what you might speak of as a transition from a class-based political identity to an identity-based political identity, which we are still uh, experiencing, you know, the, uh, the, the, the effects of in many parts of the world. And I could have gone on, I could have spoken about feminism, about state building in the global south, um, the marginalization of indigenous groups, and so on and so forth. And anthropo so anthropology is, is one of those disciplines that does not stay in the ivory tower for very long because we go out and get to know people and we are influenced very profoundly by their concerns and by what is happening outside in the world. So um, you could say that uh, what we do as anthropologists is really to try, we not only do we try to understand what it is to be human, but we also try sometimes to use knowledge to make the world safe for difference, as Ruth Benedict put it, less unequal and saner. And what is new now at the early 21st century is that we're not talking about making the world safe for human difference, but we're also talking about making the world safe for non-human differences. And this opens up a new epistemology, a new way of talking about the world. Maybe retrospectively in a generation, you will be looking back and think about this period as almost a cultural and intellectual revolution, which changed the way in which we engage with society and with the outside world. So quite clearly the towering concerns in this decade and in the last has to do with the acceleration of acceleration, global neoliberalism, and not least um, climate and the environment. So, um, the, the concept and the concept of the Anthropocene seems to be everywhere. The term the Anthropocene was initially proposed by the atmospheric chemist Paul Crutzen, together with Eugene Sommer, who is also the co author of a much cited article written uh, with his colleague, Will Steffen and the historian, John McNeil. A, a, a very good article about the Anthropocene from 2007 on the social aspects of climate change. And, uh, and I mean, this, the current popularity of the concept doesn't merely signal an increased engagement with climate and the environment, but also a view of human being as being planetary in its entanglements and seamlessly integrated with that of other species. And as I said, in this, shift there's a radical potential for rethinking what we do not only as anthropologists but as you know geographers and economists and biologists and as human beings um, whether what we're trying to mainly do is to understand the world or the human condition which are two different kinds of questions both of them raised by anthropologists so we grapple with this shift and uh, I don't know if I'm going to read out this quote. There's a long quote here about the concept of the Anthropocene. So the first reference, etc., on that occasion in 2000, uh, in 2000, uh, Paul Crutzen, the Nobel Prize winning atmospheric chemist and then vice chair of the IGPB, the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, he got impatient with his colleagues because they were talking about the Holocene, you know, the geological era after the last ice age. And he explained, exclaimed in the middle of the conference, stop using the word Holocene. We're not in the Holocene anymore. We're in the, 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 searching for the right word, the Anthropocene. And this is apparently the first recorded instance of that word being used. The Anthropocene, the era in which human footprint is making itself felt everywhere on the planet, even where no human being has set foot such as the Antarctic because of climate change or some of the remoter parts of the Amazon forest, uh, also because of climate change. Uh, and uh, so many of us, whether or not we like the term Anthropocene or not, of course, there is already an anti-Anthropocene literature. You know, people are skeptical of the word, for, sometimes for good reasons. 
I mean, uh, the formidable intellectual Donna Haraway, for example, speaks about the Cthulhu scene. Okay, I, I wonder if I got that right. If you've seen the word, nobody has ever tried to pronounce it before now. Uh, and and she refers to uh, you know microorganisms and to tiny uh, living things. So her point is that in fact this is not the era of the human. That is the Anthropocene. It's the era of the diversity of life. So maybe post-humanism is a more appropriate label. I would, I would vote for the term Anthropocene after all, actually, because we're the ones, we human beings are the ones who brought the planet into this mess. So we have a certain responsibility to try and do something about it. So um, it, we live now, and I think we've all slowly begun to understand that we live in a world of limited good, limited resources, um, Earth Overshoot Day is the day uh, on which we have used basically the resources at our disposal and uh, Earth Overshoot Day tends to be earlier and earlier every year because of accelerated growth and overheated globalization. 2020 was a bit of an exception because as you know, for, the, for reasons we all know too well, things started to slow down in the physical world. Not in the digital world, but in the physical world, things slow down. But it's not going to last unless we change track. So at the moment, we need about 1.6 planets. And uh, this is a nice uh, little diagram. I don't know if you can see it well, which uh, shows um, the threats to planetary boundaries. So the redder it gets, the more dangerous it is. So uh, some of these processes haven't taken, taken off quite yet. Climate change hasn't quite taken off yet, although we can see its implications and its results and outcomes and responses in various parts of the world. But there are other uh, changes which have gone further and which are even more threatening at the moment. So there are boundaries and we have to try and stay within those boundaries and we haven't been very good at it. Human beings have certainly, since the onset of the fossil fuel revolution a couple of hundred years ago, we've not been very good at it. And if you don't think, if you don't believe me uh, that there is something going on, okay, that warrants a term like the Anthropocene, that there has been a radical change. Look at this, the great acceleration, uh, often uh, dated from the early uh, years after the Second World War, with increased growth, increased trade, tourism, there are more McDonald's restaurants, more emails, more plastic in the ocean, there's more of everything. So a lot of these graphs, they point fairly um, fairly steeply upwards. There's a fairly steep upward curve. And I would add, uh, drawing on the research project that, uh, that Peter mentioned in his introduction, published a few books, here are some of, the, some of our publications from the overheating project, that in fact, we've had an acceleration of acceleration in the last 30 years or so, that uh, changes which took place really quickly are now taking place even more, uh, even faster. Uh, since the early 1990s in anything to do with uh, um, all everything to do with energy consumption really travel um, downloading the number of photos taken in the world was trebled in five years between 2010 and 2015 can you imagine from 1.3 trillion to 1 trillion photos taken in the world because of the coming of the of the camera phone so um in anthropology, there has been an interest in climate change for some time, not very long, but let's say about, it's been a sort of a preoccupation for a number of anthropologists for about 10, 15 years. And we already have a literature. This is probably the, the book that most anthropologists are familiar with. And it does have an interdisciplinary dimension, which is, uh, I think, really nice uh, on the anthropology and climate change by Susie Crate and Mark Nuttall uh, and the second edition from 2016, fairly, uh, dramatically revised um, uh, as, a, as opposed to the first edition from 2009. So only in those seven years, a lot of new research and new perspectives had come into the anthropology of climate change. And interestingly, this book, which is on disaster, slightly less well known, but also fairly well known uh, by, by Su Susanna Hoffman and, um, and Anthony Oliver Smith, uh, edited The Angry Earth, which is a book about disaster. It's disaster anthropology. In the first edition, from the early years of this century, there were not that many references to climate change. In the new expanded and revised edition, virtually every chapter speaks of climate change. So yes, I mean, there has been, there has been a shift. And it, it, it deserves mentioning, in fact, in this context, that the most famous living anthropologists without an anthropology degree, and of course, everybody knows who I'm talking about, um, has, um, 
shifted his attention years ago to the causes and politics of uh, climate change. Someone asked me if I can share my screen. I'm sorry, I can't because I'm, I'm not using Zoom. I'm using another app called Prezi uh, video and uh, uh, there's no way of sharing the screen. It looks like this. <laughs> and that's the way it, uh, it is. I'm sorry about that. Anyway, uh, Latour um, speaks of climate change now and he hasn't spoken about anything that I know of but climate change in very, of various of its manifestations for several years. So it's a, it's, a, it's a situation, a global situation that brims with methodological uh, implications. It buzzes with theoretical possibilities. And uh, I think it will redefine uh, not only the specialty of anthropo anthropological or other research, but also um, what it entails to be a human being within a new existential and conceptual framework. So let's see uh, now. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, I'm not wasting any more time on talking about the anthropology of climate change, because uh, many of you know it, um, but it's growing very fast. And it is almost in the same way, I, I, I mean, I'm reminded sometimes of Clifford Geertz, who said in the mid-1960s that it's very hard now to devise a good research project in, the, in what we now call the Global South, in the Third World, without bringing in nationalism. By nationalism, he meant nation building, independence movements, that sort of thing, because it's now everywhere. Even in, you know, in the forests of Borneo, uh, you'll find it, in the Andes, you'll find it. And I am almost tempted to say that most, or at least very many anthropological research projects and social science research projects this year, uh, and at this time, which have with, with some level of ambition, will have to pull in at some point or another the facts of and the implications of climate change, because it's now all over the place, it's everywhere. But this was not always the case. So let's take a step back very quickly and look at what anthropologists have done in the past. Of course, there has been ecological thinking in anthropology in the past, sometimes from the perspective of ecological adaptation. I've got an old book still sitting on my shelf in, in my office from my undergraduate years called Man in Adaptation, which is a social evolutionist reader which analyzes interactions between sociocultural forms and the environment in small scale societies. Yehudi Cohen, Ed. Um, it's an old book, you don't have to read it, but it says something about the way in which anthropologists in the past looked at the interaction with the environment through adaptation and very often within an evolutionary framework. Some people, some theorists um, influenced by Marxist theory or by Lewis Henry Morgan's Victorian anthropology or both would explain social configurations through the interaction of technological and environmental factors, which is most starkly formulated, I guess, in Leslie White's formula from the 1950s and 60s, according to which a measure of social evolution was the amount of energy a society was capable of exploiting or harnessing from its environment. Or perhaps in another um, even more popular uh, anthropologist from the 60s and 70s, Marvin Harris, you know, whenever I read Jared Diamond, I think about Marvin Harris, okay? But never mind that, that's another story. Um, so Marvin Harris, who, who wrote some really sort of racy bestsellers, Cannibals and Kings, and, and a number of other books, uh, where he erases riddles of culture. Harris believed that uh, a social and cultural configuration was a, was a function of environmental and technological factors. So he was known at the time, he was um, regarded at the time as a kind of vulgar Marxist. Uh, and uh, he, pre he raises these riddles of culture, about which it may nevertheless be said that Marcel Salins, who was none too keen on this kind of reductionist simplification, said that, you know, it's, it's good, you know, that Harris formulates riddles about culture. Actually, it's an excellent idea, it, but it's somewhat disconcerting that the answer always seems to be protein. <laughs> okay, anyway, be it as it may, these approaches went out of fashion a long time ago. Uh, while there are other forms of ecological thought that continue to inspire research. Keep in mind that the, 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 the major schools in European anthropology in the 20th century were quite indifferent to, uh, 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 to, to the environment, to ecology. There were very, very few. There was Daryl Ford in Britain, who was a bit of a loner, who was interested in ecology. Others were not really interested in ecology. So uh, the, the towering figures of British anthropology in the first half of the 20th century, you know, uh, Radcliffe Brown and, and Malinowski, I mean, they, they disagreed about a number of things, 
they uh, disagreed about the relationship between individual agency and structure, most famously, and a number of other things. But they agreed uh, in their interest in the social integration and in their relative indifference to anything to do with the environment and climate. So let me now move on because we have limited time for this lecture, okay? So more recently, there have been challenges to the nature culture boundaries, which, which is necessary and which is a result of the realization that in fact, we human beings are part of something which is larger than ourselves, which is the entanglements or the uh, relationships that we have with that which is non-human. Um, challenges to the Cartesian boundary between mind and, uh, and, and matter, very similar. There are some interesting precursors to this other ecological anthropology or ecological, you might say philosophy, okay, because much of it is actually philosophical. Here's one, Jakob von Uxkull, um, a German who uh, spent much of his time in Estonia uh, and uh, a bit of a gentleman scientist really, uh, Jakob von Uxkull, um, who uh, introduced the term the Umwelt or the, rather the uh, contrast between the Umwelt and the Innenwelt, you know, the um, well, having German as a first language, most of you get, get it. It's hard to, hard to translate directly to English. Umwelt is like, you know, the surroundings, the environment in a broad sense. The internet is that which is inside the skin. And he was interested in that sort of relationship. From Ixkul, early on, tried to interpret uh, what animals did. He tried to uh, produce a kind of phenomenological, hermeneutic approach to animal life in the early 20th century. It's, I think it's quite, it's quite a bit ahead of his time, but, um, and, and I think he got a lot of things nearly right, and he asked many of the right questions. So von Uxkull, often referenced by people who are interested in and who work within the field of biosemiotics, you know, biosemiotics, which to me is a really, really interesting methodology for studying, uh, for doing multi-species research, because uh, biosemiotics is, is, a, is a sort of a loosely defined school. Some of it goes back to this gentleman, uh, as a kind of founding father, uh, which tries to understand nat nature and interspecies and interspecies relationships as communication through science, through using uh, Pierce's, uh, you know, the philosopher C.S. Pierce's uh, semiotics uh, and, and some of the methods that he devised in order to understand what people uh, and animals uh, mainly do. So um, move, moving on to someone else who, um, same generation as some of those other people, but his life and his work has had a much longer um, life and is uh, still considered, and certainly by people like myself, um, a rather interesting conversation partner when we try to make sense of the current era and try to transcend the nature culture boundary and the mind matter boundary. Uh, Bateson puts it very pithily in, in several of his writings, and that's one of the Bon mot from Bateson, which is most famous, dif the difference that makes a difference. Information, he says, is different. Differences that make a difference. But you could almost say that everything, everything that exists in the world are differences, which are made relevant through a kind of structure of relevance to the organism in question, whether it is human or non-human. And this concept of mind is con connected to this. Mind is not something that you carry, out and carry around inside your head. Mind is something which is between, it's not inside. As Bateson said one of, in one of the last uh, video lecture talks he, he gave, when he was seriously ill with cancer in a hospital shirt, he was filmed. You can find some of these films online. And he said, you know, what do you see here? Do you see five fingers? Well, I guess some of you do, but it's wrong, you know, you see, because what you should have seen are four relationships between fingers, right? So it's relationship, it's that which is between, that which creates a connection uh, which, uh, which exists. Um, I could have gone on and spoken about Bateson, but I won't. But I'll give you one example. I'll give you two very tiny examples of, sort of his way of thinking as a way of approaching this era of the Anthropocene in a sensible uh, way, compatible with what we already know as anthropologists, but moving on in order to try to grapple with that which is non-human without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. That's a difficult thing. So he has this example somewhere in his writings about a man uh, telling a tree. And I'll just read out a sentence. This is from his very uneven, but incredibly original and uh, thought-provoking book, uh, Steps to an Ecology of Mind, which collects you know, short and long articles and little talks and various other things. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. And somewhere there he says, consider a man felling a tree with an ax. 
each stroke of the axis modified or corrected according to the shape of the cut face of the tree left by the previous stroke. This self-corrective, i.e. mental, process is brought about by a total system, trees, eyes, brain, muscles, axe, stroke, tree, and it is this total system that has the characteristics of immanent mind. In other words, the total system. You see, with a pen stroke, he erases this boundary, this barrier between that which is human and that which is not human. And then he goes on and says, quote, but this is not how the average Occidental sees the event sequence of tree felling. He says, I cut down the tree. And he even believes that there is a delimited agent, the self, which performed a delimited purposive action upon a delimited object. Okay, that's what he says, <laughs> disparagingly. Um, so uh, in other words, that makes a difference. It is something, it's, it's a characteristic of a, of a system of a process, not of something that, you know, ends as it were with the skin, stops at the skin. It doesn't stop at the skin. Uh, and the Batonian concept of mind is quite important for us. If we want to do uh, an ecologically sound and ecologically uh, informed uh, anthropology without losing the skills that we already acquired as anthropologists, but moving on to study uh, the non-human as well. So um, think about the, the, the fiction of the bounded individual with their exclusive limited mind. It can be challenged from many directions. I mean, medical scholars might point to our reliance on the human microbiota, the millions of bacteria existing in a symbiotic relationship to the human organism. While cognitive scientists have shown that most of what people think they know is in fact collective knowledge, most of which exists outside of our individual minds. No individual has sufficient knowledge of the 30,000 parts that make up a Toyota car. And yet these cars are being assembled without a fault every day on the assembly lines in the vast factories of Toyota city. So uh, uh, you see, this is one way of thinking which could get us somewhere. Now let's see how far, I don't have a lot of time left, do I? Uh, can you give me a sign when I have five minutes? Yeah, great. Okay, I still have a bit more than five. Uh, so there are some, there are some problems uh, in doing multi-species feedback, which are all too familiar. The most obvious one is uh, anthropocentrism, that we attribute human qualities to animals, right? They are, you know, the, the, the fox is uh, sly, you know, the owl is wise, etc. Like from, you know, from sort of the, the animal fairy tales. Uh, which, which, is a, which is a temptation that in fact many professional working and highly regarded ethologists, not ethnologists, but ethologists, okay, students of animal behavior, a trap that many of them have often fallen into. Uh, uh, a very influential article from the 1970s by the philosopher Thomas Nagel is called, What is it like to be a bat? It's not really about bats, it's about consciousness. But what, and about interpretation. But what Nagel says is that, you know, we can't really know. We can say something about what bats do, but we can't really know why they do it because you can't put yourself inside the mind of a bat, which is fair, but this does not mean that we should give up. And I, I should then uh, quote again, um, one, of our, uh, one of the leading anthropologists of the last century, Clifford Goetz, who says somewhere that, um, you know, don't imagine that you can say something about everything. That would be hubris, but we can say something about something. Right? So, so I, I have a cat. I feel I know him quite well, but I'm not sure what goes on in his mind sometimes. But I understand quite a few of the things he does. So I can say that, and, but, but there are a number of things I can't say. So we shouldn't give up. Uh, and there, are, there, there is a tool that I'd like to present now very briefly towards the end for trying to engage with non-human species in our anthropological work without falling into the trap of anthropocentrism and, uh, and without losing the uh, skills and the competences that in fact we have built if, if over more, more than a century of professional uh, anthropology, fieldwork, interpretation, um, taking your time, that kind, of, that kind of thing that is important for us. So I'd like to introduce now towards the end, um, a, a way of looking at um, the Umwelt and the Innenwelt and the, everything between the relationships that make up uh, our world and our lives, um, namely uh, biosemiotics, 
So uh, the, this gentleman, he's a great, great guy, great thinker, a Danish, um, he was really a chemist, uh, but he turned to biology and philosophy and a bit of system theory eventually, uh, Jester Hofmeier, uh, deeply influenced by Bateson, but also by Pierce and by biologists he had read, who were non-reductionist biologists who tried to understand ecology and not just genetics. So he had this concern with living systems, that living systems have certain qualities, okay? And we and he tried to use semiotics in order to understand and interpret what was going on in, 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 these, uh, in these worlds. And one of the concepts that uh, Hof Hofmeier introduced, if any of you are interested in biosemiotics, do a web search. There's lots of stuff available, um, uh, open access on the web uh, on, uh, on biosemiotics and some of his writings too, and some of the others. But let me give you just one example. I mentioned Bateson. One of the examples from Bateson, which says that there are differences between animals. You know, Bateson studied dolphin communication. He was interested in trying to understand how dolphins communicated, but he also writes about dogs. Yeah, great, thanks. And he writes about dogs and he says that, you know, um, dogs are able to engage in meta communication Meta communication, you know, at a higher logical level than just doing something. So a dog can pretend to bite you, but it wags its tail at the same time. So you know that it's just playing, and it can pretend to be angry and aggressive. But then again, it's just I'm just fooling around with you. You know, I'm just messing with you. It's, it's a meta message of what the dog says. And everybody who knows the dog, at least a nice dog, uh, knows what I'm talking about. Cats are not like that. Um, so the cats are, you know, uh, are different. Now, but one of the concepts uh, that uh, Hofmeier introduced, just to give you a flavor of what biosemiotics can do, is the concept of semiotic freedom. It's not a matter of either or. It's not either you're a chimpanzee or you're a, you know, um, a baboon, or either you're a human or you're a dog. Uh, semiotic freedom is a matter of degree. All life has some degree of semiotic freedom, which means the ability to uh, communicate in different ways, the options that you have. You can do this and you can do that. Some are ruled mainly by instinct, so they don't really take decisions. But lots of animals, especially vertebrates, have to take decisions all the time. So uh, the snake versus a dog. It's a story from Jesper Hofmeier's work. Uh, now, uh, imagine a rabbit, which is being chased by a snake. And the rabbit hops along, and finally it finds a bush that it can hide behind. So it, hide, it goes behind the bush and hides. Um, and stands quite still. The snake comes, you know, meandering after it and looks around. After a while, it just moves off because it forgets. It doesn't have a mental representation of the rabbit in its head. It forgets about the, uh, about the rabbit. Now a dog doing the same thing. A dog chases a rabbit. Rabbit goes behind the bush, hides, sits uh, completely still, and the dog stands there for a little while, and then it moves slowly in the opposite direction behind the bush to surprise the rabbit, right? because he knows he has an image somewhere here or somewhere in his body about the rabbit being there. So, uh, so science are not just linguistic. Everybody who spent a year on Zoom knows this, okay? That science are not just linguistics. There are so many things we miss out because we're not in the same room together. As a reminder of the fact that we communicate through science in lots of ways. And this is also taking place among the non, as it were, non-human um, uh, animals. So. Um, I'd like to say something towards the end. I'm, I'm finishing now, I've got two minutes left and I'd like to say something And Yes, I've already said this, I'm not going to repeat that. But one of the things that Hofmeier says in one of his writings, I think he's a major theorist and there are, there are others, but you know, he's one of my favorites. Um, he says that historically, if we take the long story of evolution, there has been a growth in semiotic freedom which means that there are more, more signs. The bush of signs is thicker and thicker uh, as a result of evolution. What is happening today uh, in the overheated Anthropocene that I started this lecture with is uh, a reduction of semiotic freedom owing to uh, species extinction. I mean, many of you know uh, that 70% uh, of all the birds alive today are chickens or they're fowl, you know, they're, uh, human, humanly owned animals. They're only there because we're going to eat them, 70% of all the birds, right? 4% of all the mammals are wild, 36% are humans, 
and the remaining 60% are our livestock, mainly pigs and cattle. So there is a growth, there is an upscaling, there's a standardization taking place. Think about the loss of biodiversity uh, when you remove a jungle and you replace it with a palm oil plantation or a mine uh, or a town or a shopping center or a highway. So this is taking place, as you, as you know, just as well as I do all over the world. So we could speak of the contemporary ecological crisis as a kind of a, as a step back. There has been a growth in semiotic freedom, more communication, more science, more sort of relationships taking place in nature. And now we see a reduction owing to globalization. And one of the things that strikes me is that when you speak about, with, when you speak with biologists about, so I'm, uh, I'm finishing now, I see, but I have a final sentence. Um, when you speak with a biologist, an ecologist, about the loss of biodiversity, they would often speak about it in very much the same terms as anthropologists may speak about the loss of cultural diversity. I'm not saying that they're the same thing, but they're the result of the same processes and they lead together uh, to a massive loss, uh, not only in uh, human choice and, and flexibility and options, but also if we want to be technical about it and use the language of biosemiotic, a loss in semiotic freedom. So um, that's what we had time for for now. Um, I, I stop now, but I'm looking forward to, uh, to the discussion. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Thomas, for this brilliant talk, for taking us on this journey alongside these great thinkers. Um, we have already one question in the, the chat that has been posed. It's by Karina, and she asked, um, what is your take on using the framing climate change, which traces back to the climate change denier Frank Lund, who was a policy advisor for the US Republicans? What kind of lang language leaves room for scientific assessment and activism? Hmm. I, I don't, sorry, I don't, I don't know that story. So I'm not sure if I can comment directly on it. Um, but uh, to me, climate change is a fairly neutral term because it can be observed, it does take place. I mean, in certain areas like the Arctic. I mean, Zdenka will probably speak about this uh, later today. She's been observing this firsthand in, in Svalbard, the north of, of, of Norway. It's very perceptible, it does take place. Uh, in the past, one spoke of global warming, which is a bit more contentious and a bit more difficult because it's not as if, as if that's the only thing that's happening. Uh, there are so many other forms of climate change. I mean, described poetically by the Danish anthropologist Kirsten Hustrup as the drying lands, the rising seas, and the melting ice. You know, these were the three sort of areas that she zoomed in on in her big project on, on water. So, uh, okay, she said climate change in contrast to climate crisis, emergency, etc. Yeah, well, yeah, climate change is neutral. So if you want to be uh, more normative, do by all means say climate emergency. Because it is, I, I think we can use that sometimes. But in an academic context, we somehow try to, we try to make new friends. So we try not to be provocative unless we have to. But I, but it's good, you know. We we should uh, we should critically interrogate the words we use, especially when words become fashionable. When everybody uses them, that is a cause for weariness. You know, you should then we should think about alternatives, because it's the recipe for laziness. It's like neoliberalism or precarity, which are. Are in, are in danger now of becoming a recipe for laziness. You, know, you can just say if there's something you don't like, ah, oh, it's, it's global neoliberalism. And it's, sorry, it doesn't, doesn't explain anything. Be more specific. So maybe we should sometimes. I think sometimes it's, it's useful to speak about the environment. You know, I try to speak as much as I can about the environment and not as much about climate for, for various reasons, because you can do something about the environment. The climate is very abstract. It's very hard, you know. I can, I can compost as much as I like. I can take my bike to work as often as I want to and grow organic vegetables in my garden, but that's not going to help the, uh, the glaciers in, in Peru. But I can save this little clump of trees nearby. So the environment is more, uh, it's more tangible. It's more here and now. And there are lots of environmental issues which are not directly related to climate at all, such as species extinction, plastic in the ocean, not climate change, but serious uh, climate emergency, uh, environmental emergencies. Yes, Eduardo Korn, fantastic. Uh, thank you. I was going to mention him, but there wasn't time. Someone has mentioned Eduardo Korn in the, in the chat. And he's interesting because in his book, How Forests Think, which is based on fieldwork among the Runa, a small people in Ecuador, he, he has several approaches 
to uh, grappling with the nature culture boundary and with the environment and uh, in effect with climate. So he takes a biosemiotic uh, approach. His, his teacher was Terence Deacon, his uh, supervisor, who's one of the leading biosemiotic thinkers in biological anthropology and a, and a friend of, of the late uh, Jesper Hofmeier. Um, I also know Terry Deacon, he's a great guy, and he wrote his book Incomplete Nature, and he was Eduardo Korn's supervisor, but Korn also is a card-carrying cultural anthropologist, so he also moves towards what is called the ontological turn, you know, taking other people's words seriously, uh, and uh, trying to use them in a way of, uh, as, a, as, a, as a way of finding other ways of relating to the, to the culture and nature divide. So that, those are two sort of uh, approaches, often seen as opposing, but which are fused in this uh, uh, very uh, interesting uh, book, How Forests Think. So, yeah. There was another question raised by Eva, um, and she was asking, basically, regarding the part on multi-species ethnography, based on your experience as anthropologist, would you say that these methods are increasingly accepted or still marginal? Within you know the anthropological yeah, yeah, yeah. community. Well, I think yeah, I think something things are changing really fast, and then not just in anthropology. I just had a chat on Zoom, of course, earlier today with a PhD student who's writing about the energy elites in Norway, the people who are in charge of basically um, oil exploration and uh, and fossil the fossil fuel industry. And she says that only during her fieldwork, eighteen months from uh, autumn uh, 2019, I think, and, until. Quite recently, there have been a change in the way they spoke about climate change. They were now taking it seriously in the way they weren't two and a half years ago. So I, I would say that these methods are coming in, in almost in the same way as a gender perspective came into anthropology in the 1970s and 80s. Before the 1970s, people were indifferent. Most, even, even some female anthropologists were quite indifferent to gender as a significant dimension of, uh, of human life. And, uh, and after, after the uh, early 80s, it was impossible not to have a gender perspective. And if you didn't, you had to say so in the introduction to monograph. I'm sorry, I don't have a gender perspective. So I think this is happening with, uh, with the Anthropocene, with ecology, the environment, and, uh, and possibly climate. Not, not necessarily climate, but the environment. The non-human is coming in. And I, I see this, interestingly, in, in both of the sort of extreme sort of uh, ends of anthropology, because you have this anthropology which is very much about culture and about interpreting and about difference and about uh, the radical difference sometimes on the one hand. And then you have the anthropology of political economy, which goes back to you know, the, the Marxist tradition uh, to a great extent. And both of these in different ways are engaging with the same questions. Thank you. There are two other questions which are somehow related. Um, how would you consider the role of social sciences in the climate emergency? And then the first question is also related to that. Which role should anthropologists take? I think it's a huge, it's potentially huge. It's potentially very important. And the reason is that, you know, the natural science has been in place for a long time. Uh, natural science knowledge uh, about climate change has been present and it has been recognized and accepted. And there have been UN committees uh, and statements and agreements uh, and, and, and climate uh, summit meetings for 30 years and not much has happened. So you, we need the social sciences, not only in order to understand why so little has happened, but also in order to understand how we can contribute to bringing change about. And so that's the social sciences in general. When it comes to anthropology, what we can say is that, you know, one size doesn't fit all. Local communities need to have local solutions and you have to build on the resources they already have. Nobody likes to be told that they were born yesterday, you know? White people coming in are saying, from next year, you're going to do things like this. Just forget about everything you think you know. Don't do that. Instead, say you're doing great, but you should emphasize this and not that. So it, I think it's important. Yeah. There was another question by Hertha Nöber. Might yeah. this have disciplinary impacts on the division of anthropology? Yes. Hello, Hertha. Sorry, I can't see you, but <laughs> you can see me. Um, yes. Uh, it, it might, but I think it can also bring us together, not only within anthropology, but perhaps also in a broader sense, in an interdisciplinary sense, and also outside academia, very much in the spirit with, of, of, the, of the climate work, really. Because what we're trying to do now is to, to, add, to, to add our little bits to the big jigsaw puzzle or the big painting. Uh, and nobody can 
believe or you know defend the view that we represent sort of the the key as it were we've got the key which unlocks all the doors so i think uh, in fact it will have a positive effect uh, in the way that uh, we can find ways of talking to, together for example bridging the gap between the political economy and the more culturalist or symbolist uh, parts of anthropology and we can even uh, take uh, the, the dialogue with biology seriously, which has been difficult for generations because many bi of the biologists that were who were interested in anthropology, they were you know, crude evolutionists basically and uh, had a very simple view of what human beings were uh, because they didn't understand the significance of language, for example, and metaphor, which uh, the biologists I have in mind do. You know? so, uh, so they're very keen. So I believe that we can, um, yes, that we can use the Anthropocene moment to refashion. I mean, there was a book uh, published in the 1990s called Open Up the Social Sciences by Immanuel Wallerstein, Ilya Prigozhin, and a number of other leading social scientists. It was commissioned, of all things, by the Goldbankian uh, Commission in Lisbon. Um, and uh, it's a nice little book, Open Up the Social Sciences. And what they say is that, you know, the divisions that we have today between the social sciences is really a late 19th century division between economics, political science, sociology, and so on, because it made sense at the time. But look at the world now. That was the 1990s. They didn't talk about climate and the environment, but they were interested in other things. Look at the world now. Let's think differently about uh, where we should draw the boundary between different bodies of knowledge. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm all for this. And I think uh, this could be a moment when, if, in fact, we could uh, make this happen. There is one last question, then we'll close the, the question yeah. round is um, from Gerhard Ilmeier, are Jesper Hoffmeier's position already reflected in anthropological literature? Could you recommend mm. some papers? I mean, you could also send yeah, them yeah, to yeah, us yeah. then afterwards. I could, I could, it. yes. Um, not very much. I mean, biosemiotics in general, it's, it, Strangely, I think it's uh, it hasn't really been discovered uh, by anthropology until recently. Um, so uh, there's there's some work to be done there. And and to me, biosemiotics is somehow it's more attractive to me than some of the other alternatives which are being put forward. I mean, people may disagree uh, with with this, but it is also because it connects to some of the things that we already know or that we think we know, and and it has a genealogy that goes back to a qualitative biology and interpretive biology that you could associate with people like Goethe, for example, and with some of the people who were Darwin's contemporaries. We didn't deny Darwinism, but you said that, look, there are other things we should also say about nature, uh, which are also significant. Where, and uh, I mean, thinking about uh, uh, Kropotkin, for example, uh, the, the Russian uh, gentleman scientist who wrote about co cooperation in nature. He didn't think that the competition was a good metaphor. He said that there's a lot more solidarity and cooperation, for example. Female thinkers, well, I mean, uh, yeah, I may have mentioned men, but uh, there are, believe me, there are lots of women. And one of the most important in this field in general is, uh, is, 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 uh, is, is quite clearly, uh, I mean, there are, yeah, I mean, there are, there are so many. I was going to mention some of the, some of our British colleagues, there are lots of British colleagues, I mean, who, who work with, uh, um, with with climate change and with uh, with the Anthropocene, so uh, by all means, it it must be uh, maybe yeah maybe biosemiotics is a bit male, but not climate anthropology. I mean, it, in fact, if anything, climate anthropology is just as female as it is male. Okay, thanks again for your brilliant talk. Thanks again for the questions. Um, thanks for being here, Thomas, today. And we will Thank now um, move on to the next point in our agenda, basically. And I will hand over the word to Ria. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Thomas. I think um, I speak in behalf of all of us that we could go on for another hour and listen to these insights and ask you more questions because it's just so interesting to learn about uh, this topic more. But um, now next on the agenda, as time is flying, we need to proceed here. Um, I'm actually delighted to give over the floor to the Climate Walk project initiators. Um, they will now tell us who they are and how this project actually started and how it came alive. So please, I don't know who of you will start to talk, but I will un uh, mute myself and you can just unmute yourself. Thanks.
Yeah, hello and good afternoon to everyone. Um, let's just wait for the presentation. Yeah, you should see it now. Yes, great. So yeah, thank you for the great introduction and the great talk, especially. Um, my name is Alexandra and here, anywhere, are Martina, Gerald, Anna, Julia and Eva. Like Martin, we are part of the Wonders of Changing World team, and now we're going to present to you our project, the Climate Work. So who are we? We are an interdisciplinary team with a transdisciplinary approach, consisting of academics, activists, artists, and above all, friends. We combine social and natural science, as well as social and artistic work, in order to unite different disciplines and perspectives, and to integrate them into research. But what are we doing? Well, as the title already indicates, we walk, as simple as it is. As of June 2022, we walk 12,000 kilometers across Europe to collect empirical data on climate change and changing climates. People often connect climate change to lonely polar bears floating on icebergs. But what happens to our livelihood, the place where we live in, should not be overseen. That's why we walk through different biophysical and social cultural climates to look at the very local outcome and to emphasis on unseen places and unheard voices. We want to examine and understand local perceptions and experiences of living in environments impacted by climate change and the everyday practices in coping with it. It is about connecting the stories together to create a better understanding of this complex phenomenon and ultimately bringing people together to form bonds of cooperation and solidarity. And through this, we want to connect the global with the local for which we invite everyone to walk with us. So the next big question is, how are we gonna do this? Our project is not just a research project, but also an educational and even a media art project as we are also not only researchers, but activists too. We don't look at climate change or in general our social cultural system from an external position as it wouldn't affect us. We are part of it and we feel the consequences. Yes, we use unconventional ways to gain knowledge and we also use unconventional ways to spread it. But maybe this is necessary today so that local voices are be finally given the opportunity to be heard and inspire more people to actions. And now Eva will show you our route. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, so as you can imagine, the basic of all of it is we walk. And we will walk from the North Cape in Norway to Cabo de Roca in Portugal which takes us around 18 months. It's going to be around 12,000 kilometers and we go through 16 countries. We got asked a lot of time, why this route, why you chose this place? And actually there are multiple answers to that. The pass has been chosen to cross various landscapes and to see many places and different cultural livelihoods. Further, we have chosen this route together with local actors like NGOs, universities, artists from each country who told us where might be underrepresented places and voices and also places where climate change is already visible and discussed. We actually planned the walk for June 2021, but as the current situation is too difficult to do such a project, we postponed it for one year to June 2022. But as our team is already kind of like ready to walk, we are planning at the moment an Austrian walk in this summer. But for more information to this Austrian walk, this will come in the next weeks, but as we are planning it at the moment, we invite you to get in contact with us to share your ideas, which places where we should go, uh, which voices we should hear and try to include it in the route. So I hand on to Gerald and to the research pillar. Thank you, Eva. Um, yeah, as we've heard before, um, our project really is based on these three pillars and um, the one of which I will present to you now shortly. Of course, there is much more to be said about this than just in a few minutes. But um, yeah, I'll try to convey the basic idea <clears throat> behind our research aspect. 
our main research question, <coughs> sorry, our main research question, um, how do people experience climate change and changing climates throughout Europe? Um, is of course only one thing uh, which we want to find out. Uh, we want to find out a lot of more um, answers, um, but this is, as I said, the main research questions. And, and the center of this lies um, the experiences, which is made both of um, made up both of a symbolic discursive side and a material dimension. So it's perceptions and narratives on one side, but also practices um, on the other side. So the focus are really um, is really on the experience at the intersection of climate change and changing climates. And why do we talk about climate change and changing climate? Um, well, to represent or to yeah to make visible the, both the biophysical um, side of things and uh, the socio-political, socio-cultural and economic um, side as well, which of course is also reflected in, um, in the term Anthropocene as we've heard before. Um, but these two spheres are not, um, um, not ontologically distinct, but analytically. We take this division to really show the relationships between these two kinds of um, dimensions and spheres. Um, and of course, on the local as well as on the global scale. So these really um, are co-constitutive spheres. Um, right, and on the next slide, you can see our theoretical framework, which is um, inspired by the Marienthal Studio, which um, especially the social scientists under you will probably know. Um, and these are <clears throat> dichotomies we set out to really bring out the relationships between the two poles. So you can see the examples here, um, for instance, nature, culture, or material and ideal, individual, collective, structure, agency, and so on. And on the intersection, right in the middle, between these two spheres lie the experiences and the landscape, um, which we want to shine lights on and, and make visible and um, hearable. On the next slide, we can see two um, <clears throat> two examples of these axes. We have um, unheard stories and stories, which um, with these we can pose the questions like which stories are heard, who or which actors speak, in which way, and in whose interest about climate change, which storylines are pushed through um, the discourses, so to speak. Um, you can see the approaches um, and concepts which already exist in the social scientists, uh, sciences. Um, yeah, below that we have structural collective and agency individual, um, how do collective experiences interact with individual experiences would be one question um, and approaches and concept, concepts you can see here. If you're interested uh, in them to read further into it, just uh, you can contact us or um, research them yourself, but we're always happy to share them with you. Um, yeah, that's just, as I said, short introduction to the theoretical framework. And on the next slide, we can see our methodolog methodological approach, um, which is really made up of three phases before, during the walk and after the walk. Um, before the walk, we do a discourse and text analysis, as well as a broader, so to speak, analysis of the countries and regions we will walk through. Um, in the second phase during the, uh, during the walk, we have a mixed methods approach um, which we called footwork, um, which is made up of really a mix of more conventional methods like um, interviews, surveys, and participant observation, but also more unconventional methods uh, like podcasts, blogs, and blogs, and which also um, kind of goes into the other aspects of the, of the um, project. For instance, the education project, which uh, Julia will present to you now. Thank you, Gerald. Yeah, the ed education project is the second um, pillar of our three pillars. So what we do in our education project is um, we hold uh, certain workshops with different target groups to create a knowledge mobilization and safe spaces for knowledge and experience exchange. And we also want to empower people to learn from each other and to cooperate with each other and to act. Uh, we don't want to serve as teachers, so we want to mediate between um, actors 
and we want to raise awareness about uh, local and global challenges and to connect them with each other. The second part of our education project is the online lecture you attend at the moment. Let's go on to the next slide, please. Yes, um, the SDGs uh, we use uh, as a framework for our workshops. So for those who don't know what it is, um, the SDGs are the 17 um, sustainability development goals um, that were adopted by the UN um, in 2015, which encompasses social, ecological and economic aspects. Um, here you can see three of them as examples. Please go on to the next slide. Thank you. Yeah, and what are we doing exactly? Um, our methods are quite um, uh, diverse. So um, it goes from presentations and discussions um, to interactive games, um, uh, as well as world cafes, questionnaires. We also do um, and uh, are creating at the moment some walking methods like silent walking, audio walking, and also use uh, more artistical interventions like, like land art. Also the project management tool Dragon Dreaming storytelling and reflective learning. And now I give on to my colleague, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. So the third pillar of the project is called We Create, and it's all about media and art. And it's where we combine the first, uh, the outcomes of the first two pillars in order to spread the unheard voices and unseen places internationally. It is really important for us to escape this academic bubble and to reach a wider audience but especially to create necessary narratives to reach people on an emotional level. So for this, we collaborate with local artists and filmmakers to accompany us and make a documentary about people, about how people experience climate change. And we also want to encourage individuals to film their own environment and their views and to include this into our research. So to tell our stories and the stories of people we meet on the way, we will have monthly podcasts, we'll have blog, blogs, um, videos, uh, photos, a documentary, a travel guide and wandering exhibition. And on the way, there will always, always be creative gatherings where we invite local artists to join the workshops and transform their impressions into artwork. And further, we want to invite the, art, the artists to give their own workshops to interested people to enable them to express their emotions. And open stages are more informal events that will take place at different locations on the way. So they will create another type of connection and the feeling of togetherness by giving the chance to express oneself, to listen to and to enjoy many more voices and stories. So here are three types of visualization in more detail. Um, the travel guide will happen, will be produced in collaboration with the local society and travel agencies. And we want, with this, we want to draw attention to climate change and to socio-ecological initiatives in the regions. And also we want to promote walking as alternative tourism and its health benefits. So after we finished our walk in Portugal, a wandering exhibition will start at the North Cape and move along the visited locations on the route. So um, individuals and artists um, will have the possibility to share their impressions, stories, and perceptions about climate change through various forms of artwork. And this will give everyone the opportunity to experience people's impressions throughout Europe. And finally, a bi-weekly series produced with Octo will give us an additional opportunity to keep everyone on track about what is going on with the wanderers or what are their daily challenges and their experiences with people and nature on the walk. So to sum up, you can see our, um, there are five dimensions of the project. We walk, we talk, we listen, we create, and we connect. And with these dimensions, we are creating a comprehensive understanding of Europe's climate. It's about creating awareness about climate change and the individual experiences, perspectives, and solutions to give space to unheard voices and unseen places and to connect local with global issues. So we want to create an international network that extends across Europe um, where everyone should be involved and further collaborations should arise beyond the project. So one example of this would be the collective awareness and connection platform, which enables students and researchers to connect and exchange information while walking. So now I will hand over to Martina. Thank you, Anna. 
So we are pleased for any support and we can get um, and so we are pleased for any support we can get. And we are young fellows. And although we brought that amazing project to life, we cannot know everything and we are still learning by doing. That is why we decided to consult a multidisciplinary knowledge association consisting of representatives from the academia, from activism, or from other organizations, institutions, or just other partners. And they act as a board of advisors and have knowledge on various levels. So everything that is made public in any form before, during, and after the walk, especially when it comes to important decision-making, to writing concepts and larger publications, that is checked by the Knowledge Association. And they give us feedback and their thoughts, doubts, comments, advices then flow into our outputs. Next slide. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we are also, um, we are already also supported by some partners, um, partner organizations. These are research centers, institutions, NGOs, and companies. And they all provide us with different types of support. They support us, for example, with products, they provide workspaces, expertise, or they provide us um, with some financial or media support. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to know more about our project or would even want to support us, there are many ways to do so. Uh, check out our website. There you can also find a link to our crowdfunding webpage if you want to support us financially or follow us on social media, or subscribe for our newsletter, connect us with your institution or your work, or just spread the word and walk with us. And when it comes to the walking, we also have a volunteer program where researchers, activists, artists, uh, students have the opportunity to join us for two to three weeks. But of course, you can also join us anytime and just walk with us as long as you want. In any case, we appreciate and we are happy about any support and engagement you can give us. Um, and also check out our new videos on YouTube. And to end this project presentation now, finally, we will finish up with the words, keep walking. Oh, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. It is... Um, great to see, I mean, now visually what you have um, come up with in such a short time and how many people you have gathered already around the project to support you. And um, I wanted to ask if there are any emerging questions. I think we could deal with one or two from the audience. So um, if you're there and have a question, you can Post it in the chat. I can already see that there was a comment from Gertraud Ilmeyer congratulating you on this great project, which I can only second. And um, yeah, so I think it's great. Like the slides um, from this project presentation, we will have them on the Moodle platform, and you will also have the email address there and all the contact details. So if you feel like you are ready to walk along with them or if you can uh, contribute in, or if you want to contribute in some other way, you can just contact them directly after the lecture series. Okay. And I think now, Martin, before going into the break, we are almost done with our first session. We'll go to the try and boring part <laughs> to the formalities of this lecture, how the students can actually get their ECTS. So we have prepared some slides. Yes. And I will, I will soon share them. What I also wanted to say is on, the, on, the, on June 17, there will be again a, a Q and A session with the Wanderers of Changing Worlds. So, in case until then, if, if questions are popping up, then you may just post them on the 17th, of course. And of course, you're also we're glad if you write to us uh, and ask your questions. So I will now share the screen. Let's see if this works. Let's 
So that is it. You see this one? Yes. Perfect. So I'm just going to quickly um, explain the design of the course, which is very much um, related, of course, to the design of the project, of the Climate Walk project. Um, so this week basically is dedicated to an introduction to the Climate Walk and to climate change. So we will have in the second part of, of today's class a panel discussion um, revolving around issues of climate change and intern transdisciplinarity. In the next class, and this resembles then the dimension we walk, um, we have a session um, on ethnography and research on foot. So a lot of different lectures on, on, on walking as an, as an interesting method and, and walking as the starting point of, you know, of maybe um, cooling down this overheated um, world um, to, to refer to, to Thomas Hill and Ericsson. Um, in class three, under the header of We Listen, it is more about rather typical climate change research projects. So we, have, we will have four different lectures from speakers coming from different disciplines. In class four, as you can see on the poster to the right, um, we talk, that's the header of this session. So it will be about the nexus of climate change, education and global citizenship. We will talk there with educators. Um, here's some people from WWF, from the national parks in Austria, how they are dealing with climate change, how they convey the message of climate change or, uh, or the climate crisis to people interested. Um, in class five, we will approach um, climate change from an arts perspective. And here our speakers will discuss how climate change is currently visualized, that is one part, but then also how insights from climate change could be, you know, creatively communicated through pieces of art to a broader audience. That is also one issue there in climate uh, in class six, we will have two parts, the first part will deal with climate change communication so how to communicate climate change or the climate crisis we will have some interesting lectures there. And then in the second part, we will have again a panel discussion on, you know, on the on the relationship between climate change, climate crisis, and the need for a socio-ecological transformation. Again, we will have very interesting speakers there talking about the need for a more fundamental, so to say, radical socio-ecological transformation. And on May 20, that is that is basically class seven. We will do one last panel discussion where it is all about you know prospects of of um, of fighting the climate crisis challenges that are currently lying ahead of us but then also you know very much posing the question what we can do now so this is basically the, the structure of the whole course and as you can see of course it relates to we walk we listen we talk we create we connect so that is now you know the idea behind uh, behind all of that and i will hand over to ria which will um um, clarify how the final assessment and how the, the, the getting of the ECTS points works. So yes, for you, for, uh, for all of you who are students in this course and who have signed up um, uh, to take this course through the University of Vienna, you can get three ECTS points by submitting a seven page paper at one of the four exam dates. Uh, the first one will, will be on the 21st of June, and then we have one in September, one in November, and then one next year. So you will have plenty of time to finish your assignment, and this assignment will be a take-home exam. So you will not have a test, uh, you will not have a multiple choice uh, some multiple choice question at the end of this lecture series, but we really would like you to engage um, and discuss critically the topics that we have been or that we will be discussing throughout this lecture series. So the final assignment paper should include the title page and the bibliography and um, the minimum work count is 1,800 words. And we have also a maximum word count. So this is 2,500 because we don't uh, want to add, uh, end up reading 40 pages of your, <laughs> of your beautiful thoughts that you might have. Um, yes, yeah, so the content of this seminar paper um should consist out of so you choose three thematic sessions and lectures that you were particularly interested in and um you will have six mandatory articles so we upload every 
after every session, we upload one article on Moodle. And you can, I will show it to you in the next slide where you can find it, but it will be there. So it's easy for you. You just go on the Moodle platform, click on um, the mandatory reading and there you will find a PDF file where the text is. So you are supposed to be, uh, to be doing some reading throughout this class. Uh, but of course the texts, they're always connected um, to the, lecture that we have and then yeah and then you just write it together and um uh yeah so you cannot send it to us per email um we will open up a folder on moodle on these dates that are mentioned on this slide and then on those dates you can hand your paper in so for example if you are on the 20 fourth you would want to do the exam but then you forget to hand it in then your second chance will be on the 9th of september so we do not accept papers then on the 25th or the 26th um you know what i mean here okay the, can i have the next slide martin please so here is our moodle website you know when you look when you log into your moodle you should be seeing this you always have the zoom link there we use a permanent zoom link so it's always the same link that you can log in and there you will find the general information also the poster that martin showed you earlier and if you go to the next and last slide you can see we have here some information about the the classes so here we have class one which is today you have the time then you have one folder for slides um, or the link to the video because this is being recorded so if you cannot uh, take part um, one evening then don't worry you can always go back and watch it the day after and then you have that one folder where it says compulsory reading. That's the one you have to read. <laughs> and then you have optional literature. So there we will put everything that might be interesting to you or that is also relevant and connected to the session. So I think that was the general information. Does any of you have questions? regarding the assessment or this last, um, the final task, the take home exam. If not, the chat seems to be quite quiet. Um, we actually managed to stay in time and we have all deserved, I think a 15 minute break before we continue with our next session so i think martin is there anything else that you would want to add before we go into the break no not yet thank you so we will reconvene at, at 18 30 at half past six and we're looking forward to the panel discussion and to the panelists and what they have to share with us and then also there will be a big part you know where the panel discussion is open up to the general audience and you will have much more time um, to post your questions and add your comments. So see you then. See you in a bit.
back from the break. Um, I hope you all had a good break and that you um, had some fresh air or walked around. We know that these uh, online sessions can be very tiring, especially if you sit here for three hours in front of the screen. But um, we hope and we just know that this last session will be so interesting that you would want to be still staying in front of your screens. So um, we are now in the second part of today's class and we will uh, continue now with the virtual panel discussion. And we are very delighted to have some experts here with us tonight who have been intensively working on the topic of climate change. Today's panelists all come from different backgrounds and we can't wait to hear their perceptions and thoughts of this emerging issue. And I will quickly introduce whom we have here. Uh, the cameras are already on. We have Professor Dr. Eva Horn. She is a professor of modern German literature at the Department of German at the University of Vienna. And she's also the head of the Vienna Anthropocene Network. Then we have Dr. Sarah Nash. She is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna. And she's working on the politics and policy of climate change and human mobilities in Europe. Um, next, we have Katharina Rogenhofer, a graduate from the University of Vienna and from Oxford. And she is one of the coining figures of the Fridays for Future movement here in Vienna. And currently, she is the speaker of the Klimafolksbegehren as well. Then we welcome Dr. Zenka Sokolikova. She is a guest researcher at the Department of Social Anthropology at the University of Oslo and an associate professor at the Department of Studies in Culture and Religion at the University of Hartrek Karlov in Czech Republic. I'm so sorry if I pronounced these words wrongly. Then we have Professor Dr. Peter Schweitzer whom you already met in the first session. He's a professor here at the Department of Social and Cultural Anthropology at the University of Vienna. And last but not least, we have Professor Dr. Eiko Feucht, who is a professor of climate science at the Faculty of Geoscience, Geography and Astronomy. But um, let us start with a quick round of self introduction, because you all know the best what you're actually doing and how your own research relates to climate change issues. So Eva Horn, could you maybe start? Um, yeah, okay. I, how, how much time do I have? How, how, how can I Am I allowed to get into detail or is it just one sentence? We thought that if uh, everyone could like uh, for three minutes approximately tell what they're doing and then we will later on go into the discussion and, and then you can go deeper into your topic. Okay, um, maybe I, I would like to make two points that um, stand for what I have been doing in the past and what I'm doing currently. Um, as you said in your kind introduction, I am the founder together with uh, uh, Michael Wagreich of the Vienna Anthropocene Network. Um, Peter Schweitzer is also a member. Um, so the Anthropocene is one of my topics. And uh, so regarding climate change, that would mean that I try through the lens or, or the, the, the the glasses of uh, an Anthropocene perspective, I try to see climate change in a wider context. You will probably say, but look, climate change is such a big context um, and we need to specialize, but I, I still believe it is only part of the huge um, ecological crisis that is, is made out of many other problems where climate 
um, plays a specific role as something that binds everything together in a planetary way. So that would be my perspective on climate change, one, one side of my perspective. The other perspective is the perspective of a cultural historian. So thinking about climate change um, for me means to think firstly about what is climate? Um, what, how do we relate to climate? How have we have um, European Occidental cultures related uh, to climate in the past? And how did climate become what it is now? Something that is imperceptible in a certain way. We only say well, there's no, no bad weather, there's only the wrong clothing. Um, climate is an object that we can only perceive through the computation and measurement uh, of the climate sciences, um, which is new. Uh, climate once in history was uh, something that could be perceived with all the senses, and I'm trying to reconstruct the history of uh, this concept of climate in a critical way to bring back the older um, or a more um, holistic idea of climate back into our discussion of climate change. Thank you so much. Um, let's continue with um, Sarah Nash. Uh, hello, thank you very much for the invitation to be here this evening. It's great to be on a panel with so many eminent figures. Um, I'm Sarah Nash. I'm working at the Université for Bodenkultur in Vienna. Um, as a political scientist, but I'm actually working and coming from a very interdisciplinary background. So I started out also as a kind of linguist studying German, Germanistic, um, then went on to do political sciences and I have a, a human rights degree as well. And then my, my PhD was technically in political sciences, but in a group on an excellence cluster working on climate system analysis and prediction within a geography department. So I, I, I really kind of have um, lots of different influences coming into my work there and kind of struggle to describe myself as a pure political scientist, although obviously sometimes you have to. Um, and, and kind of following from that, I would say that, I mean, in my discipline in, in political science, I would say that climate politics is still very much emerging as a specialization. You know, if you look at the habilitation thesis that people write in, in Austrian universities, they tend to be in kind of more traditional areas, you know, political theory, comparative politics, international politics. And I think that climate is often seen as being kind of a topic you work on within one of those um, more traditional specializations. But I, I kind of hope, I'm kind of hopeful we might be able to see that starting to change. Um, for me, I've worked on kind of international discourses on policy making, so international climate negotiations, the COPs. I also worked on policy making at the nation state level, uh, looking at framework uh, legislation on climate change, climate change acts or Klimaschutzgesetze in German. Um, and now more recently again on, on how nation states in Europe are seeing the links between climate change and migration, human mobilities in that sense. Um, also co-PIing a really exciting project at the BOCO that I'd like to plug called Vienna Climate Games, which is funded by the UAV for the city of Vienna, where we're researching together with young people in Viennese schools, looking at how young people understand um, climate protection measures at the city level, uh, what they want from politics, but also as the title suggests, developing in our group, but also with them, a card game that can be used in schools um, as a teaching resource, not to learn facts about climate change, but to actually experience political negotiations. You know, why don't certain measures get passed in politics? What aspects influence the process of designing climate actions? So very much tying into this, how climate action is understood and negotiated at a societal and political level. Thank you so much. Sarah for that introduction and we will continue with Katharina Roggenhofer. Um, hello, I'm probably the only one here who doesn't study what I, I'm doing now with um, the climate change movement. Um, so my background is scientific. I studied biodiversity conservation and management and um, 
from that perspective, I um, also looked at how habitats change with climate change, etc. Um, but I wanted to do something more hands on because I realized that after 30 years of a very specific um, climate science, um, it didn't, um, it didn't bring about the change that we have or, or that we want to see in, in climate politics. So um, I, I did an internship at the UNFCCC, the uh, institution that organizes the climate summits every year. And then I met with many other activists from all around the world and I kind of, it kind of hit me that this is not only a scientific topic, not only um, a theoretical topic, but a, a topic very close to home for so many people around the world. Um, and that changed something emotionally for me. And I did like, I, I made a step that many people do in the other direction. I think many people go from activism to science. And I, I did the other way around. I went from science to activism. I started, um, Together with two friends, I started the Fridays for Future movement in, in Austria. I organized the first climate strike 2018. Oh gosh, this is three years ago. Um, so yeah, this is my background and now I'm the spokesperson of the Klima Volksbegehren. For those of you who don't know what a Volksbegehren is, um, it's an agenda setting initiative or a popular initiative um, where a motion that is signed by more than 100,000 voters can be submitted to the National Council for action. Um, so it has to be discussed in Parliament and this is what we did. So our demands were um, very, very, well, sorry. Um, we demanded, most of the demands um, are pol political. So we demanded a right to live in an intact environment to be put into our uh, constitution. Uh, we want, um, a CO2 budget to be put into legislation because um, to meet the Paris Agreement, we have um, a remaining CO2 budget that has to be put into legislation. Uh, we want an ecological and social tax reform, um, renewable to roll out renewable energy and leave fossil fuels in the ground um, and to further public transportation. So all the demands that um, might lead us to a climate friendly future. And um, last Tuesday actually um, was the uh, last discussion in Parliament for us. And there is a motion that is passed by the two parties um, in government, um, which has some of our demands in um, this motion. So there will be, for example, a citizens assembly um, that is put into place um, 2021 and um, many other things that uh, concern our demand so that was very successful and now we are fighting for even more um, for the for the later date where where parliament gets to agree on that motion um, in March yes that's for that's from my side thank you Katarina it's also great to have you here in our panel discussion from outside the academia and see what is going on there and what the discussions there are um, I just got a message that we lost Tenka um, at the moment. She has some technical difficulties to log in, but uh, as, soon she, as soon as her internet uh, works, we hope to <clears throat> have her back in because she was here in the start, but now unfortunately something happened. So we are working on that. But in the meantime, it would be great if uh, Eiko Voigt could introduce himself. Yeah, hello. My name is Eiko Vogt. I'm a, a relatively new professor at the University of Vienna for Climate Science. Uh, so I joined uh, the university actually two months ago only. And I might be the least interdisciplinary person in this panel. So I'm actually trained as a physicist. I wanted, when I was younger, I thought I could become a cosmologist or someone studying the universe. Then I realized, well, maybe uh, there's something else to study, namely the planet Earth. And I've Enter this field out of the realization that this is an interesting and maybe impactful and helpful topic to study. But uh, I must say I'm studying this um, out, of out of curiosity and out of appreciation for the beauty of the Earth system. So uh, I always say that people should not rely on me to save the world. Um, I will not be very helpful in doing that. Um, 
but uh, so I want to uh, just so as, as, a, as, as a bit of background for my research. So I'm a, I'm a physicist. I'm looking at the physical aspects of the climate system, most notably clouds. So I, I ask a lot of the question, what do clouds mean for the regional climate change? So what do they mean for the atmospheric circulation, how the atmospheric circulation responds to climate change? These are all topics which are important for regional manifestations of global warming. And so maybe that's helpful. Um, and so in our discipline, I think, uh, well, I can only speak for the physical discipline of climate science. The interesting part is that it's actually a solved problem for us, or at least to some extent, it is a solved problem. From a physical um, uh, point of view, this problem was solved probably 20 years ago. I mean, there's no question that there is global warming. There's no question it's, it's, it's due to anthropogenic activity. There's many interesting, uh, important questions that remain about regional climate change, but there's no question that something needs to happen. Um, so this is, uh, just want to put that out. Um, so uh, yeah, being this kind of uh, a bit monothematic person doing science, um, I still like the opportunity to, to listen to what you have to say. So this is also for me a chance to learn. And so I'm looking forward to, to the next hour and a half or so, thanks. Thank you so much. I can already hear from the introductions that this will be an interesting discussion, uh, getting all these different perspectives. Um, and we have one more panelist to introduce himself, and that is Professor Peter Schweitzer. Please go ahead. Thank you, Ria. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a social and cultural anthropologist and and until rather recently, it was not not very common for anthropologists to be to be interested in climate change. In my case, uh, that actually started to change already 25 years ago or so. By that was triggered by the fact that I, starting from 1991, I moved to uh, Alaska uh, for and took on a position as this assistant professor of anthropology there and. Basically, in my 20 or so years over there in Alaska, I, I, whether I wanted or not, I was confronted with, uh, first and foremost, a small university that was already by necessity much more interdisciplinary than our enormous uh, machine that we have here, uh, where, you know, where you often have a hard time knowing all the people from your own discipline, but, you know, where a small compact university where, where it's much easier to, to meet people from, from other fields. And, and I, I came, I stumbled into a center called the Center for Global, Global Change, um, that was the term back then, Global Change, um, and, and Arctic System Science. Um, in the early to mid 90s, and then was somehow made a member and, and and it was primarily, I think for a while I was the only social scientist there, but, but and, and, and really I, I, I learned a lot <laughs> about these issues um, that I could just also mention. Um, but I also tried to bring in a perspective, okay, we are talking about global, especially in the nineties, you know, when, you know, in, especially in Europe or so people were not really talking about climate change. So I said, I said let's not just focus on the climate, let's also focus on other forms of global change. If you already call that global change, you know, there is, there is many other things, many other triggers happening in developments. So that so you can imagine if you're, if you're in, in, a, in a room with only uh, physical scientists, uh, that's, that was argument was not necessarily terribly um, successful, but still, I think over the years, uh, we, we found some, at least, um, a, a workable basis of uh, interdisciplinarity. Not, that, I think that's, that's a separate uh, discussion. You know, what is really possible if you work across disciplines. But, but I, um, through my Alaska experience, I started in the late '90s then to work with natural scientists, not only physical scientists but also biologists, on particular research projects primarily in uh, rural areas of Alaska, primarily with indigenous communities. And so to say the role for, for the anthropologist was classically to, to kind of, you know, um, communicate, um, to um, have conversations with, uh, with the local people, with the indigenous people about the changing environment. And, and to see in a very 
fine-tuned way, you know, certain, uh, you know, basically include what would you call these ways uh, th these days, um, um, traditional ecological knowledge into into some interdisciplinary um, research agendas, and at the same time also also get a feel for very different explanations of change, because obviously you know. Also, if you go on the street here today, you know, people have very different explanations of why things are happening or changing for that matter. But everything else, I think, can happen later. I, just, just to make it short, all to finish up, I obviously didn't stay in Alaska. In 2012, I moved back here um, to, to Vienna and um, I have a professorship now. And I, I have to say, in the beginning, I was still very much focused on, on climate change issues. I have moved a little bit away from that, not because I find it not relevant on the contrary, but I think I see now that lots of social scientists are engaged in that field and um, probably you know, see less the, the, the necessity that everyone does it. My, my, my real focus right now is the built environment and infrastructure, but of course it has to do with climate, uh, issue, uh, with climate and other issues of the Anthropocene. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your introductions. Um, we have now organized, we're now moving into the second part, basically, after the self-introductions. Um, and we have organized this first part around basically three compounds of different questions. And the idea would be that this discussion would first be a discussion among you panelists. And then afterwards, um, we will open up the whole panel discussion to the to the audience so that people have the possibility to, to ask questions. So first, um, whoever feels then after after us having posed a question, whoever wants to say something or wants to respond or wants to add a point to what another one has said, just feel free to do so. So the first um, question compound, the first um, the first questions we want to just throw out basically into the round is, and this is very much related to probably maybe um, the different knowledge level also among our students with regards to climate change or with regards to the climate crisis. So maybe not all students um, have this kind of like background or this 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 knowledge what climate change is. So the actual the, the actual first question would be to you: What is actually climate change, or what is climate change from your respective perspective? How do you conceptualize climate change in your daily work, either as, a, as an academic or as an activist? And then also, um, how would you describe the current status quo with regards to climate change or with regards to what is happening in your field of expertise, be it um, academic or be it your, your activist circles you're, you're currently in or the movements you're currently working with? So whoever feels, whoever wants to add anything on that or wants to answer these questions or tries to answer, I mean, these are broad questions and um, just feel free to, to do so. And you, you may, I don't see all of you, which is a pity. I don't know how to change this, but you may just raise, raise a hand or, or you know, um, make yourself visible somehow. <laughs> I can see you also. Just that we are not so many, so you can just turn on your microphone and start talking. Maybe I'll, I'll start because I have a rather unorthodox view on climate change because I'm a, I'm a scholar from the humanities. Um, and so I'm neither looking at the political side of problems nor at the science side of the problem. But maybe I, I, can, I can throw in three perspectives that I use in looking at climate change. The first one would be what types of narrative do we have in order to address climate change? Um, it might be a narrative of wake up. Now we have recently discovered, I could just say that, I think he said it, uh, it we, we know this for 20 years now, and we have wasted a lot of precious time in discussing whether the climate science might not be robust and whether there's dissenting views and crap. And all this is made out of different types of narratives, uh, one of which would be like the climate 
skeptic narrative would be uh, that there has been climate change throughout the history of the earth. And so, you know, the, the, the climate is always changing. It's got nothing to do with human interventions. Um, that would be one, one narrative. There are dystopic uh, narratives, like we are heading for apocalypse, e extinction of the human species, and so on. A second question I would like to address, and that relates, I think, a lot to the research that Peter Schweitzer is doing, is um, how do we perceive climate change? How can we bring people to talk about their private or collective perceptions of climate change? This is, I mean, there, Peter has a much, um, a much richer field of, of discourse because it's happening much faster in, in the north, in the polar regions. But even in, uh, I mean, in Austria, there is a wonderful project by the uh, Zentralanstalt für Meteorologie und Geodynamik, the uh, that has people, citizen scientists, look at plants. This thing is called phenology. And this is a way of perceiving, if you keep a diary on when which flower blooms in the spring, you can see global warming even on a very, very short, uh, uh, in a very short uh, period of time. These perceptions I'm interested in as well. Um, I look at this in, in literature, in, um, yeah, in, in historical medical discourses of climate perceptions, um, in, in epochs when the body was essentially used as a barometer. They would perceive climate in their bodily states. And that's very interesting to look at in the, in the 18th century. There's also a discourse on, that would be my third point. There is a discourse on climate change um, starting in the early um, 17th century. A historical perspective on how uh, the Roman culture was different from today's Italian culture. And then it really starts in a certain way, in an interesting way, with the age of uh, industrialization in the beginning of, the, in the late 18th century and beginning of the 19th century. So, even if we say hmm, there might not no, be no scientific consensus, on, on the other hand, there is a a century old history of perceiving climate change, at least on a local level. People would see that their water uh, supply is changing, that landscapes are changing and so on. So that is also not at all a new discovery. And I'm interested in these historical, but also in a certain way, way um, aesthetical uh, dimension of climate change. Uh, it, you say aesthetics, not just as beautiful objects and art, but uh, as perceiving things with all the human senses. So maybe that's an opener. Maybe some of you will say, oh my God, no, <laughs> this is way too theoretical. Let's go more hands on what is happening now um, and what does it do to people? But that's my humanities um, point of view on things. Maybe then I, I'll just jump in here on top of that and add to that because actually I don't find this perspective too far from my own at all. Um, I come to it obviously in a very different way, but I also work a lot with narratives, discourses and what effects these have within our political systems. So I think it's actually a very similar starting point here. Um, you know, for, I think for me, the first important thing to say on when we're talking about what is climate change is to recognize really explicitly that it's not just this physical process happening out there in the world and affecting our weather systems. You know, this doesn't mean saying that we don't recognize the anthropogenic nature of climate change or ignoring negative impacts, the violences of climate change, what does people's lives. But what I mean is that climate change is also a social construct. Um, how we understand climate change is an inherently social process, how we react to climate change is an inherently social process, and how we then, the political scientists and me, how we make rules surrounding climate change is also a social process. And I think that's kind of the basis for my work on that anyway. And then to kind of take that further for politics and, and, and policy making, this means for me questioning a clear linear link between 
climate sciences and climate policy. And I think that's what lots of traditional models of policy making have done. Um, I think often it's believed that the more good climate science we have, and then when we tell that to politicians and policymakers, it'll get included in our laws and policies. Um, and I think that's being questioned more and more. You know, we see Fridays for Future, one of their core messages being listen to the science. Professor Void said, well, it's a solved question. So there's obviously something happening there, there that is more complex than this, this really simplistic idea would, would suggest. Um, so for me, this means that one of the jobs then that we have to do when we come from this understanding of climate change within politics is to say, well, what's happening in these processes? You know, how does climate change make its way into our political discourse and in what manner? Um, how does it make its way into our policies and laws? And what else is happening along the way that influences the outcomes here? Because um, obviously there, there's a lot of social processes happening that influence how climate science is transferred into our rulemaking or not, um, that I think we need to be exploring. Stop Thank you so now. much. Um, I will just quickly now um, say, uh, introduce Tsenka Sokolikova. Um, I can see that uh, they have managed to come online from Svalbard and I can also see that um, the name in the box is not Tsenkos, but Alexandra Myers, who is my dear colleague. <laughs> uh, so I assume that you both are in Norway in Svalbard at the moment because you seem to be sitting in the same room. So welcome to this panel discussion. And maybe um, I will give the word uh, quickly now to Tsenka. We are already in the middle of the discussion about um, what actually climate change is in your field of research and how it affects the people and landscape. So maybe you can say something to that as well. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry for the technical glitches. It was not really my fault and Alex uh, helped me out here. I just want to add that um, what I think is very interesting in, in our locale in, in Svalbard, Thomas Silan Eriksen, who is my mentor during the project that I'm now running, mentioned it in his keynote that I will, I will talk about it, that here in Svalbard in the high Arctic climate change is something that is very present, very visible, happening very fast, it's tangible. Uh, but uh, what we see here when we talk to the people who also are experiencing impacts of climate change is that there are many other things that are happening parallel, hand in hand, and some of them are primarily linked to changes that we are witnessing when it comes to both climate and environment. I think that was also an important distinction that Thomas made, that it's not the same. And sometimes it is complementary, and sometimes it is a bit, a bit against each other. So anthropology should pay attention to that. But then there are also many things, many things happening on on different layers that can only be secondarily or almost not at all related to climate change. But people like to talk and think about those as well. So I'm very curious about how the project Climate Walk will manage to address that. Um, Thomas mentioned also that. Nowadays, almost every research project has to deal or tackle somehow the issue of climate change, right? It's penetrating kind of everywhere. But Climate Walk wants to focus on it. So I'm very, very curious about how you manage to balance that and how to do it so that you can pay attention, listen, really truly listen to people, what they have to say, even though it gets to the issue of the environment or climate from the other side. It's not direct, uh, directly about that. So that's, uh, that's something I've been struggling quite a lot uh, during my research, because I came here with the idea that climate change and environmental change will be the primary thing and that people will be very concerned and engaged and, and interested. But actually what, what popped up very often was that there were other things that were quite, quite high on the agenda. Uh, so how do, you, how do you do it not to silence what people have to say and still get to the point that you're interested in? That I think will be quite challenging, and I'm I'm looking forward to listen how you how you're planning to deal with that. Peter. Yeah, I think that that silencing that Stenka just mentioned is an is an important um, point, uh, but. <clears throat> 
going back to this to this general question that you posed, uh, what is climate change? You know, I I I, I like Eva's um, putting in there that uh, climate change is also narrative, and and Sarah supported that as well. And and I think for me this is the exciting thing about climate change is that it's this it's uh, it's constructedness and its physicality so that, that it's it's uh, it challenges uh, too simplistic uh, um, notions of social construction and um, at the same time also in any kind of uh, simplistic attempts at positivism but but I think we we need to, we need to address both so uh, changes are happening before our eyes especially if you are in, in Svalbard or in other parts of the Arctic but in most parts of the world at the same time we see that that uh, you know just by by calling something climate change or so that already creates social reality so it's a social construction as Sarah and uh, and Eva said and I think we need to be careful not to you know, it's, I think it's wonderful that I, I think I, while I was still in, in Alaska it, uh, around 2007, probably or so, at one point I was back in Vienna and gave a talk somewhere. And I mentioned that I'd been involved a lot in climate change research. And, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and the audience were primarily anthropologists and other social scientists. And there was a, a complete disbelief. What, the, what, what, what is that? You know, why, why would, why would social scientists even deal with that? And 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 I think now we are luckily at a very different stage. But I think we we also need to be careful that we do not kind of overdo it. And uh, you know, as Stenka mentioned, that everything needs to be climate change. Um, I I had a, a colleague in Canada, still have the same colleague in Canada, who told me a couple of years ago that in this one um, in the social science and human uh, funding agency, SHIRK, uh, as it's called in Canada, there was a period when there was a requirement that you had every project had to to deal with climate change. So people invented stupid things uh, just to get funding, but but basically then avoiding other important things. So we do not want to get there. We, climate change is too important to, to kind of be being kind of overused and then discarded at some point. That's, that's it for now. Heiko, yeah, please. Yeah, we can say it's a bit theoretically a bit academic, but that, uh, uh, if you talk about climate change, you can talk about what is climate. Climate is not actually properly defined as a quantity. So if you talk to different people they will tell you different definitions of climate and um, so that maybe it's a bit speaking to this idea of well what what does climate change all entail and uh, if you think about the history of physical climate science at least you can see that because it started with the atmospheric science then sometimes later people realize well the ocean plays a role later people realize aerosol so air pollution plays a role then people realize well the land surface plays a role so now it's a uh, cryosphere science or glaciers, it's carbon cycle, it's getting to longer time scales, more components. So I think even, I just wanna point out that even the term climate is not a fixed defined quantity in this. And even, the, and, and maybe even the term climate science is not, I mean, there's no definition of climate science that you can look up in a textbook. That means that climate change itself is, has, it depends on the perspective that you, that you take. It's just my two cents on this um, this topic. Um, I think from an activist perspective, we have to um, make everything um, as easy as possible to understand. Um, and as such, I think um, uh, Sarah mentioned Fridays for Future and their call to listen to the science. And I think um, what has been discussed a lot are for example, the 1.5 degrees of the Paris Agreement. So we should stay below, well below two degrees, but better below 1.5 degrees. There was this um, very famous IPCC report in 2018 um, that uh, showed the differences between two and 1.5 degrees and that they are stark. Those 0 0.5 degrees will change so much in our um, earth ecosystems and, and, um, and patterns uh, of, of, of weather and climate um, all around the world. And I think, um, but still, I think um, 
that narratives are really important as um, a social from a social movement perspective because I think it was for Fridays for Future um, was probably only as big um, as it then got because there was a 16 year old girl sitting down with a sign um, and that changed the perspective on climate change from a perspective of environmental sciences or those people who hug trees or that like the nature or whatever um, to a perspective of the future and future generations and children. And I think everyone can kind of relate to children because either you have children or nieces or nephews or you, you are yourself young or whatever. So um, that's kind of more tangible for many people to think of their own offspring of the, um, of, of, of the next generation and of um, the future and wish for something good in that sense. Um, and I, I was actually surprised that um, I also, I think I have been brought up by the idea that Sarah mentioned that you have to have the good science and that, that science tells something to politicians and then we have good laws. Um, but I think this is, this is such a complex issue because from an activist perspective, I also feel that there is an issue how the media deals with those topics, for example. How do journalists um, cover those topics? Who covers them? Is that like a very, um, very small article in the back of the newspaper? Because the, the biggest newspaper articles are um, most of the times politics or e economy. And those are not the, um, the, the, the places where you usually find um, climate change topics, but you should find them there. And it's like how uh, topics discussed and in which respect do people mention climate, um, the climate crisis? Is it only in like this natural um, environmental science part or is it more, um, has it more to do with the way our economy works, our society works, how people can actually feel it because for the Klima Forks began, I also traveled a lot through Austria and I, I can say for myself, there are so many people who feel it. And those are people who either work in nature, uh, for example, in forestry or um, who are farmers, but also people who have allergies and they have allergies earlier on uh, in, in summer now and stuff like that. So, so many people feel it, but so it's not talked about or, before Fridays for Future, it was not talked about a lot um, in the general public. So I think this narrative change of the Fridays for Future movement has really brought um, change to how we perceive um, the climate crisis. Thank you so much, Katharina. Uh, we had a comment um, by Eva Horn about children. So maybe she could say something and then Aiko had his hand up. So first Eva, then Aiko. Yeah, I just I, I was a bit polemical in saying, uh, do we really have to have children in order to care for the future or for the integrity of the planet? I do not believe so. I think what uh, Fridays for Future, of which I am a great fan, don't get me wrong, really did was transposing a complicated, complex uh, scientific message into very, very simple slogans and bringing that and there the kids come in bringing that to a group of people that is completely disenfranchised that is muted by our political systems they have no voting rights they have basically no voice and that's what happened they took a voice and then that that movement gained momentum for the whole society uh, because may maybe people do not always have kids or are kids but they all like kids and everybody agrees on the fact that the future will be will you know the kids will be the persons who are involved with the future they will have to bear it out and so i just I wanted to contradict the idea that this is a children's issue and that you need to have kids in order to care for the problem. Thank you for the comment. And I can already see that Katarina posted um, 
uh, something in the chat. So do you want to quickly comment before we go to Aiko and then we go to Tenka because she also commented something. Yes, I, I did not say that we have to have children in order to care for the planet. I don't believe that. But I think um, it changed something in the way we talked about things. And even if you say everyone likes children, this is also a new narrative. I just, I, I, my, my only comment was that it changed the narrative from the climate perspective where people care about the planet and the nature and whatever, um, to we care about children and future generations I, I didn't say that you have to have children for that, but I think it brought the topic closer to home for so many people. I complete. Yeah, so maybe a, first a comment to Fridays for Future. It's a kind of amazing as a climate scientist to see how I think more than 30 years of climate, climate science were unable to kind of do something substantial and then uh, well, some non-scientists come and find a way to to talk to politicians or to raise awareness that we are as pure scientists have, have been like pretty much incapable of doing so that's actually really really amazing one thing that kind of uh, came to my mind is that when you talked about well how do people how do you communicate climate change and i think one one kind of story to remind ourselves and that maybe that's a story of not so successful climate communication from the kind of physical climate science is the story of polar bears. I mean, kind of the polar bear was a, a symbol of climate change, and that's for good reason. The climate change is most pronounced at the Arctic, and that has profound implications for ecosystems. But who cares about polar bears? I mean, they're, they're kind of cute, but I don't, I mean, like, I would, I would rather not like to see one, so it's maybe not so bad. Um, so, but what, but what I want to, what I want to, what I want to highlight is the fact that I, so I said climate change in its, but the fact that the climate is changing due to human activity is a solved problem. That's true, but I think the unsolved problem, which is where I would situate myself as and, and argue for that more needs to be done is the fact of um, the experience of climate change at the local level by people, which kind of makes it tangible to people. And this, and this is actually becoming possible now also from the physical science of climate change. So now we're having models which act on grid resolutions of say two kilometers, which are global. So every two kilometers, you get a, an idea how the temperature will evolve over the next I don't know, 30 years. I mean, this is something we, we, we are working on. It's not, we are not there yet, but this is going to happen in the next five years. And this is very different from the models that we have used so far where we have a grid point every 100 kilometers. So you can at most say something about like country level temperature change. That's very hard to communicate and very hard to link to impacts. And people care about impacts. People want to know, do I need to build a higher dam? Do I get more extreme precipitation? What's going to happen to my agriculture? And the, but I, I want to say that the physical science is actually leaping towards this, a period or a, or, or a time where we are going to be able to make such statements with some confidence. So this is also, so I think it speaks to this, and I think it's important to, to, to know that because it's important for climate communication and how people experience climate communication or climate change individually. Yeah. Stenka, do you want to, to add anything regarding the note you, you were? No, it was actually just an anecdote that I remember Thomas once told me, many of you perhaps know Arne Nes, who is quite a famous Norwegian eco-philosopher and the founder of, of Deep Ecology. Um, so it was just, just an anecdote to comment on that. And perhaps I would like to get back to the, the, the very question, what is climate change? Because those of you who will be walking the climate walk, these are two people who are trained as anthropologists, right? and you want to focus on this particular topic, climate change, then you, you need to have an idea of what you're actually looking for. And as we already mentioned, uh, there will be a lot to talk about with the people that you will be meeting and listening to. But a lot of that will be go around the idea that you perhaps have when you start this venture. And as anthropologists, you always enter the field with some kind of preconceptions and pre-understandings, but it will be changed profoundly, transformed through the experience and also the fact that it's a very, a very innovative methodology and very also physically, psychologically demanding and walking through different countries where the discourse of climate change is presented and communicated in a different way. So people associate different things. 
under the term of climate change, leave alone the linguistic or the language issue, because you will be talking to people in different languages. I think there is a lot, there is a lot there that is very exciting and very worrisome and challenging. And uh, it will be cool if we could discuss this a bit uh, so that you could use also these discussions for like getting ready for your project because you have to be aware of, yeah, there is this physical thing, but there is also the narrative slash discourse. How do we deal with that? How do we ask questions so that we don't push our topics and our ideas into people's minds because we, we want to listen authentically to how people perceive, experience, interpret, etc. I don't have an answer to that, and I've been struggling with it a lot here in Longyearbyen. So, I just want to share this and uh, see what other things, what other think about it. May I first respond to that also a little bit on behalf of the Climate Walk project? I mean, it's not only about climate change, you know, in a very narrow sense, and maybe this is also something that maybe even you know scientists could learn from activists now in a sense that the climate crisis has been you know very early actually on already been understood also as a social and political crisis and maybe this is this is then you know the way the point from which we start not on, only looking at you know climate change in a narrow sense but also what is happening around us and that is also what we mean by this kind of like changing climates thing and i mean of course we could discuss should we you know abandon this very narrow understanding of climate change altogether and rather speak about the Anthropocene or rather about, you know, the socio-ecological crisis as something like that, um, or about, you know, more specifically or about the climate crisis. But yeah, I mean, a lot of very interesting points you raised and we're also currently struggling how, of how to, to deal with that, um, especially because, you know, only through walking, we will not be um, very easily able and maybe if, if at all able to, you know, grasp biophysical changes of landscapes. I mean, um, but we could grasp what people are saying when they speak of climate change, when they speak of what is important to them and things like that. Um, Peter also wanted to, to say something and then maybe we can get back to the, to the aspect of this kind of like link between climate science and policy making and I want to follow up with another question on that. I, I, I wanted to continue what um, Aiko had said about, you know, the climate science communication or this 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 seeming broken link there between uh, between uh, climate science and 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 human action. And I think um, I find it also interesting, as as uh, as um, Aiko had mentioned this, you know, what Greta Thunberg managed to to do what what climate science hadn't managed to do. But I think it also tells us a lot about us humans. We are not particularly rational. You know, we are partly rational, but that's really only part of, of what we how we structure our actions. And 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 I think we really need to understand that that better that the the, the power of emotion, the power of pictures, as you of images, as you said, of, of the of the drowning polar bear. Some of these pictures are fake, I believe, but but uh, but they are they 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 do something. And 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 I think that's that's really very interesting uh, lessons that we can learn here. Also, also I think um, these um, it's it's um, you know we we also want that 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 we as humans change the way we live on this planet in, in a variety of ways. And 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 I I find it interesting how sometimes things work and others don't. You know, if you if you if you tell everyone you don't, you're not allowed, you shouldn't. And so, you know, this is this, this only works to a certain degree, you know, certain prohibitions or, or kind of moral guilt or so. But on the other hand, you see people just happen to eat less and less meat than they probably did 10 years ago for a variety of things. And I think it also become became more fashionable to eat vegetarian and to eat vegan and not necessarily because you know for for some people it has something to do with climate change and it has something to do with a with a particular um act to to do something for the climate but i think it is it is important to to sort of say color the 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 actions that we want the 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 the, the behaviors of the people uh in a positive way and not i think if we if we just if if the climate can only be solved by by we are we are guilt ridden in everything that we do, then I don't think we will get very far. Um, and especially we, I think this international dimension has already been been. I do a lot of work in Russia, 
and and clearly it's so different there and in a way nobody cares <laughs> to say to put it bluntly and and i think you have that situation in many countries and we also need to deal with that that shouldn't be an excuse here for us in in austria or elsewhere what to do and not to do but we we need to be aware that that our own bubble is often just a bubble all for now Thank you very much. Um, at this point, I would uh, like to also tell the students that if you have questions, you can post them in the chat. Some of you have already started. <laughs> and uh, while Martin still has a prepared question for you, I will take in the meantime, Hertha Nöbauer has written something there and I will read it out to you. She wrote, in my view, it is important to consider children, the young generation, also as a symbol of the future. It is them who embody and represent the future in the present. Focusing on the younger generation is less about experiences and memories of the elder generations, but much more about hopes for the future and the good life in the future. What thoughts does that bring or bring to you? Um, I agree, but it's kind of a truism. And I would like to, if we look at the power structures that we have now, and it, we, if we look at the, the age, the average age of politicians, just like think about the Trump-Biden uh, <laughs> elections, uh, we are looking at older generations and even, even older than me. So I would not like to let these people off the hook. Um, there is, it's not just that children are nice and we like them or we should have them or should not have them because we're actually facing or we're in a situation of total overpopulation as Stenka uh, pointed out with re referring to Anna Ness. But there is a responsibility and there's a lot of philosophical thought about the structure of the responsibility towards future generations that has nothing to do with having children and liking them or grandchildren and liking them. Even people who do not have children do have a general and in a certain way abstract responsibility towards that generation. And that means um, not just saying, okay, we, we, we need to do some, some ecological planning for the future, but it also means of um, a, it, it means that we have a, a, a bond between these generations and that they can hold the elder generation accountable, um, even in a legal sense. And so I, I think this is much broader. It also brings us to think about the disenfranchisement of younger people. They have no voting rights. Why? Why should not babies who will be living on this planet for 70 years or in this country for 70 years should not have rights? Maybe, you know, assumed by their parents. But um, I think we need to not just think about climate, but that raises issues of economy and of course also of democracy and democratic rights. If we think about this generational problem in, inside uh, climate politics. Okay, thank you very much Eva Horn. It's a very good point, Stink. I wanted to uh, respond, I think. Yeah, I think this is a very interesting issue that we are raising here, this generational issue or conflict, even one would say, and I, I would actually strongly warn against um, portraying the issue of climate crisis or emergency or just climate change neutrally as, as something that could create even more polarization in within societies or communities, because I think if we look then ethnographically at all movements and all resistance, um, yeah, movements, activism, you can actually see that in many of NGOs or just grassroots initiatives, you have all sorts of people and it is across generations. And what we, I mean, I agree that it's important to focus on, on kids and youngsters because they're the future, but at the same time, there is an important issue of continuity. And if you even enhance already this feeling of, 
the climate is an issue for the young ones, while the old ones belong to the so-called old world mentality and they're too much caught in the fossil industry world. I think we're even like constructing more a barrier that perhaps might be there already, but it could be more fruitful to try to dismantle it and show where actually the interests of all age groups and gender groups and uh, whatever nationalities where they merge or where they have something in common. So I think uh, it will be also interesting for you during the climate walk to try to strike a balance in a way or not to focus only on, for example, on the youth, because I think it would be wrong. And it's, it's, it's very interesting to actually listen to what the elderly have to say to see how they remember, how they create the environment memory, how what they remember about the climate and the environment, how it is changing and why, try to find out why, what is the, the story behind how they tell um, these, how they how they narrate about those changes. So I I hope your project can also show um, that it's a topic that is relevant for people regardless of their age. Um, yeah, that was what I had to say. Yeah, we hope so too, <laughs> actually. Maybe um, I, I want to hand over at this point, maybe to, to Katharina, maybe you can tell us a little bit about, you know, the work of the Klima Volksbegehren, because I mean, the Klima Volksbegehren is not only something that is only, you know, carried by young people, but I guess like a lot of different people involved there, a lot of different people that have actually signed the petition. So how would you respond to, to how, what do you want to add on this aspect of this generational aspect? Um, I think actually this generational conflict is more um, talked about not inside the movement but outside of it looking inside because it's um, it was started like Fridays for Future really started with young people and th there is no uh, way of denying that but also in Fridays for Future there are so many alliances right now there are parents for future grandparents for future scientists for future artists for future whatever you name it so there are many different generations that now joined um, the movement. And I don't think that this generational conflict really is there, apart from the theoretical po point that people who live on the planet longer had more um, effect on the planet before. So the politicians that are in, um, in office now, like um, I don't know, Biden now and Trump before um, and Sebastian Kurz in, in, in Austria, they have more power probably than only one person who is not even, uh, who cannot vote uh, or who has no voice in, in the political system. Um, so I think it's more the question of power than of um, the age differences. So there are many people in power who don't, um, know or who don't care or who don't understand what their their power might be in changing um, a society the economic system whatever in a direction where um, a sustainable life is possible and i think this is also the question that i as an activist ask myself um, a lot is how can we change those narratives or how can we um, get into those spaces where we have power and as citizens, for example, our power is most of the times the, the power of people of like really people who go to the streets and the, 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 the amount of people who go to the streets or um, to be visible and not we don't have that much money, we don't have that much political power and we don't sit in the right offices. But I think um, what with the climate movement really changed is that you can see um, many people getting active and um, also understanding their agency. So it's not only young people, but I think it's so empowering for a movement that you can really see that you as a person make a difference in that whole movement. Um, and I think this is also what, what Greta Thunberg, for example, said, you're never too small to make a difference. And I don't think she means um, like the, her height or whatever, or if, if she's a child or, or a grown up person, but you're never a, too small of a person to really change something in the system. And I think this is a realization that many people in the movement have through 
and experiencing their own agency. Thank you so much um, for your thoughts. And I think from that power of people and the agency, we can go directly to Peter, who commented that he would like to make a comment about human agency in the climate context. So please. yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how fitting it is right now, but let me just quickly throw it out. It's, you know, as Aiko reminded us, you know, there is, uh, we, we, we know that that this particular kind of, of climate change that we experience is, is to a large degree, degree anthropogenically driven. So, so we the, the, sort of say there is human agency behind there. Um, but, and also a lot of, uh, so climate activism is by definition also human agency, so to say on the other, on, on the other side. Uh, so you could say what, what brought us into this climate crisis is human hubris in the sense that we we kind of thought we could do whatever we want. And of course, to a certain degree, as, as Stenka reminded us uh, via Thomas Hüland Erickson, as we were only a few people, we could do that for a long time. But in, in, a, in a way, in, in a way, it, it was our <clears throat> we, we, we kind of overestimated what 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 could be done. And the question for me is also now in terms of agency, aren't we overestimating ourselves now on the other end? I think sometimes the narrative seems to be a little bit too simplistic. Maybe, you know, if we have the, the 1.5 degree goal, life will be good. And I think, unfortunately, that's not the case because as one prominent climate scientist at some point uh, uh, explained to me, you know, this, the, the, the kind of, uh, the, it's, it's, it's like a, a, a huge tanker that has left the port and you know to kind of until you can stop that thing and maybe turn it around that will take a very long time or is basically impossible to a certain degree so uh, I, I, I think we we on the one hand we need to realize the power we have also political power as citizens in this hall and the power we we already spilled, so to say, the beans we spilled in, in causing the crisis. But at the same time, we also need to understand that, that uh, the, the task might be, might be too much for us. I, but I do not want to, to argue for any kind of fatalism. But I, I I'm just want to bring that up, this whole issue of what can be done, what is our agency in all this. Thank you, Peter. And now we give the word to Sarah, who has been waiting patiently. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to jump in, I guess, because I mean, for the first time for me ever in the past uh, year, year and a bit, I've been working directly with young people in the city of Vienna on a project on climate change um, in Vienna Climate Games. And I wanted to kind of make two points. One, a very conceptual point that we had at the start of the, uh, the project, and also then a kind of more uh, reflective point about our role in the process. The kind of conceptual point was we spent a really long time, um, longer than we expected, working at how to talk about the young people we're working with. Um, because we, we're, you know, very much using citizen science. These are not people we're using as research subjects, to put it bluntly, but people who are researching alongside us um, and, you know, developing the results with us. And we were finding we were writing school pupils or school students or young people, and it wasn't quite feeling like the right um, words to be using. So we've started in a lot of things referring to young citizens um, to talk about the people we're working alongside. Partly, I think, to try and Get, bring that sense of agency into that discussion there and you know give the, the political role also that we're hoping to play with the project um a, a, just to signal that I guess and that kind of comes on to the the second point I had or you know our role being a bit kind of reflective about what the researcher role then is while working with these young people and we really wanted to facilitate their opinions and their ideas about climate change coming into the, the discussion. You know, it, it's already been mentioned so many times, they can't vote. Um, and I actually had some really interesting discussions with some of the young people because I lost my voting rights thanks to Brexit during some of the, the time periods that um, 
we were working with young people so they were suddenly realizing that I also got it and I really understood what what that meant on that side um so we really didn't want to be like lecturing at them or um just trying to educate lots of facts but really kind of get the information and, and co-produce this knowledge but at the same time we obviously know that in our jobs and with our titles and our education we have a kind of very privileged position and thinking about kind of knowledge and power relations and um, we obviously have kind of a certain legitimacy in, in terms of knowledge that we produce with our names on it um, so we're kind of doing things like also co-producing um, a policy briefing that we're then going to make sure goes to city government etc to kind of transport the voices of the young people as well so that's kind of two debates I guess that we had internally and that we came up against in, in our project that or maybe interesting for others as well. Thank you very much for sharing these insights with us. There were two more points in the chat that were somehow relating to each other. One was, was um, formulated by Miriam um, that um, relating to the power aspect. And then the other one was by Anna, which was also related to that, you know, with regards to climate justice or environmental justice, you know, having all actually those groups that have basically caused the, the, the crisis, so to say, are. Uh, um in many cases the least affected ones and those that have not you know um caused it are, are the ones that have to bear the costs like how would you um or does any one of you want to elaborate on this kind of like inequality injustice um aspect of the the current climate crisis so to say Well, again, me <laughs> as the party, who, the problem with inequality is that uh, the the um, em emerging economies uh, in in India and China uh, or Indonesia, Brazil, etc., show that what is happening is more industrialization. So, if we have more equality, that means basically catching up with the pollution level of the industrialized countries. And that's a big problem. How can we, I mean, we we, are, we have it, we, we tend to say, oh, the Chinese don't need cars, but maybe they do, and maybe they want cars and the Indians, etc. These are the fastest growing uh, markets for cars, and uh, these are the big polluters. And the question is how it's really uh, not just, oh, let the, the dirt poor people catch up, but it's really about um, a, a, a kind of a tragical problem uh, where the basic load of uh, the responsibility, again, I believe, lies in those countries or those economies that have right now the biggest impact. Um, and, you know, the so the china china also becomes a big player in in an ecological policy uh, as as does india or australia um but just saying we want more equality would basically mean rising raising the level of uh, of uh, you know pollution uh, co2 emissions etc can i just comment on that really quick um, I find that very interesting because you could also say that if you split China into um, areas of land that have the same population as Austria, they still have per capita less carbon emissions. So those areas with the same amount of people would have less carbon emissions than we do in Austria. And I think um, as I mean, I agree that I think I don't think that every country can develop over the path that we have taken, but I think this is also not the discussion here. There, there is the scientific um, uh, uh, thing that is called leapfrogging, where you kind of jump over um, a technology that was used before. So that happened, for example, with telephones. So we built landlines in, in Austria. We had, the, we had to build the landlines above land or, or beneath. And many, many countries, um, for example, in Africa, jumped in um, with cell phones. They didn't have to build the landlines. So I think there is also this point of um, if we, as, for example, the European Union with a Green Deal, move forward in a way that um, would move into a, a direction where you have a society that can live with 
um, with their resources um, more sustainably and who need less energy or um, re reduce those, um, uh, produce those energies with, for example, uh, I don't know, um, through solar panels and whatnot. Um, you can also um, project that into other countries or project that those technologies can also be used in other countries um, and they can kind of leapfrog over the polluting path that we have taken, which is not happening right now. I agree with you in China, there are still coal mines that are being built and stuff like that. But I think there is a point to make that countries ha who have historically polluted a lot might need to go forward because they are the richer countries. They are the countries that have the resources to, for example, develop new technologies and kind of um, also share those knowledges and share those technologies with the world so that many other countries, like for example, India, don't have to develop over the same path that we did. Thank you, Katarina. I think the chat is becoming really active now and um, Max there. We only have, by the way, 14 minutes left of this session. So time has um, been flying. Um, but Max wrote a while ago, I also think that it is too simplistic to say that agency only belongs to human hybrids. It is fundamentally a global economic system, capitalism, that is responsible for the climate crisis. How would you, that there's people who agree here with Max, so who wants to comment on that? Eiko, please. Yes, I'm, I'm, ex I'm going to expose my ignorance, but um, I mean, uh, I would agree that climate change is part of a systematic challenge or a system challenge, that's true. But I would also like to raise the question of, um, you can only fight so many fights and you can only win so many fights. Like, so what is, the, what is the feasible pathway of solving the climate change challenge or climate crisis in a way that does not rely on solving all the other problems? Or is, it, is that possible? I mean, I'm, I'm just going to ask a question, but I feel that um, there's a tendency to make a problem bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and, and I'm not saying it's not big, but I'm going to ask just the question, how can you divide and conquer the problem instead of making it bigger and bigger? So, so I'm just hoping that someone else can answer that question. Is there someone in the panel willing to respond to that? Peter has his microphone on at least. Yeah, but uh, I wanted to actually respond to this earlier question or the, the, I think it was a question in the chat about the, uh, um, about, uh, the role of capitalism in that. And, and for me, of course, you can, um, you can have long debates about that, especially of, uh, about so-called turbo capitalism. But I think on, on a very fundamental level, I think that's, uh, uh, at, at, at least we, the, the only direct comparison we had in the 20th century uh, were the so-called socialist countries, which were ecologically speak speaking a catastrophe. You know, if you looked into Czechoslovakia or into, into, in, into the Soviet Union that I know best, you know, this is from from our perspective. It was really terrible, and 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 uh, so at least if you if you if you compare it on that level, you could say you know many people argue they know that was not the right kind of socialism or whatever. But but um, I, I um, hopefully there will be some kind of alternative in the future. But at least uh, so I, I see it more as a, if you want to see it in a historical way, then I would maybe tie it more to in, into the industrialization, the industrial society, uh, but but not 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 necessarily to capitalism, socialism, or something like that. That's why I'm also uh, find the notion of the capitalist scene very kind of short sighted and, and inaccurate. There is also one very interesting uh, point currently raised by Eva Spiegelhofer, and she was saying that actually when it comes to having a political voice, this does not only apply to human beings, it, it applies, of course, to all other living beings on this planet who are not human. And, and, and she wonders now what um, your, your take is on that. Does a more than human view, view on the problem only complicate the climate debate? Is it still, you know, is it still human agents, you know, acting? Or, or should we 
move towards you know, what Ivan Illich once said is kind of like conviviality paradigm of you know different beings living together and looking at at how we our actions affect you know other beings. Yeah, perhaps I can start here. I think this more than human view definitely complicates, and that's exactly why we should go for it. Um, it's challenging. It, it 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 makes it more difficult, but it's even though we don't know yet to which we to what we arrive, I think it's it's one of the good ways to go. It is perhaps not the only path to follow. I would not argue to like diminish all the other angles that we can explore, but it, it is a rich one, definitely. And there is also another comment now in the chat that I actually wanted to go in that direction, um, replying to what Peter said, and he had a very good point there. There is an interesting person here in Svalbard. His name is Kim Holman. He's the international director of the Norwegian Polar Institute. And he's very active also in communicating climate science. He's a climate scientist himself, but he's very active also on a political level. He's um, uh, publishing books about ethics in the Arctic, and he's, he's, he's very much engaged in this sphere. And he, he now um, mentioned in one media uh, outcome or interview that there is this strange narrative uh, which makes us believe that if we change the way we live, if we, um, if the standard of living that is only accelerating, like this overheating, right? Where where can we stop? Where when do we live a comfortable life enough so that we can slow down? We we don't seem to be capable to decide on that. But there is this narrative that we have to get rid of something or we have to renounce on something so that there is more balance or so that we damage the planet a bit less. But perhaps we should look at it from a different perspective. What do we gain that we don't have now if we live a different life? And again, going back to your project and what you're up to, I hope that you can also meet people that can tell you stories about what kind of life they're living or they would like to be living or used to be living and can't live anymore and they're missing it. So what are these alternatives? It doesn't have to be a systemic alternative like dichotomies, capitalism, contra socialism. This doesn't lead anywhere. I agree there. But perhaps we have a lot of tiny alternatives that can't, they don't need to have a big label or a name with a capital uh, letter on it. But it can be small stories of individuals or groups that can teach us something about a different way of life that is not so much focusing on, a, on an accelerating and improving, improving, progressing standard of living that not everyone on the planet Earth can achieve because then we are really in a deep trouble. But perhaps it's not about renouncing on something. It's not about pointing fingers and blame and guilt, but it's about, yeah, let's have a look. Let's have a different look on life and what we want from it, what, what want, makes us happy. And perhaps we will discover also with help of this more than human perspective that there are other things that are also worth investing in um, than those that the system we have grown up has taught us. Thank you. Aiko, please go ahead. Yeah, I will, I will strongly echo that perspective and say like, I wouldn't phrase it as a question of uh, not being allowed to do something to save the planet, but I would phrase it as a question of how do you want to live? And so, for example, why don't you, for example, I don't have a car and I, and I hope that I never will own a car because, and, and not because uh, I, have, I would have a feeling of guilt if I own a car, but because I just like to not have a car and because it's more comfortable for me, it's actually more, I kind of enjoy my, 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 my everyday life more if, when I don't have a car because I can just go everywhere by bike. It's just so, I mean, this, so, so this whole idea of phrasing it positively instead of raising guilt, I think it's very important. I agree. And that is also, to me, this also makes it tangible to people. So I would, I would try to argue for make it small steps that people can do instead of change the whole world, which would be nice, but maybe it's a bit hard. Thank you, Aiko. And uh, Peter had his hand up, but before uh, he can turn on his microphone, I would like to remind that we only have five minutes left. So it would be great if everyone could say maybe one final thought. 
Okay. Let's do it like that in response, maybe also to what is in the chat, because unfortunately we can't take like all the questions anymore that are there. But you should you should save the chat. I think that would be yeah. Important. We'll uh, sorry, I, I, I wasn't following the chat. I, it's just one more thing that I would like mm -hmm. to throw out, and that's technology. I think we haven't discussed that at all. And I think, uh, in my view, this is also important to see this as a positive thing because you know th I think there are certain things. I often think about flying, you know, we know that, you know, lots of flights are unnecessary, we should fly less, but at the same time, we, you know, since flying was invented, I think humanity will not go back to the time when there was no airplane. So I think the real challenge of the future is to find technologies to make flying less harmful for the environment. If, you know, 100, 150 years ago, taking the train was terribly polluting for the environment. It was actually a, a, a terrible thing. Well, today it's, it's, it's this kind of symbol of clean, of clean transport. So I think technology has a very important role to play, which, yeah, um, I, I would like to end here. Thank you. Katharina? Um, I just wanted to comment on that because I find it very interesting that you say that um, uh, the technology, um, we will not get back to a time where we don't ha have airplanes and I totally agree, but I think this is also how I look at the economic system and before you said uh, we have to just look at the socialist countries and that didn't work out, I think this is no, um, this is no argument against envisioning a new economic system where we stay within our planetary boundaries and above a social uh, fundamental space and give everyone the right to live in an intact environment while um, not living in poverty and stuff like that. And I find that very interesting. So I, I also agree with um, Alexandra and Aiko on that, that we, we have to think of this new kind of living and of this new um, perspective that we can take um, when envisioning the future and how, how rich that can be and how, um, how we want to li probably live a life that um, is more centered around community and that uh, where we don't need a car and can easily go from A to B in a very sustainable way. We can just jump on our bike and we don't have to fear to be driven over by a car or whatever. <laughs> um, and there are green cities and we have those spaces where we can just relax. And during Corona times, we just, we, we have experienced that people without a garden, they need parks, they need spaces to go outside. So how can we create those lives um, that are at the same time more, more sustainable and climate friendly and richer, I think, than what we have now. I think there is this new way of living out there that doesn't demand as much resources that um, don't that doesn't lead to um, the climate crisis, but is still richer and fuller in experience. That is that is actually a very beautiful final statement. I think. I mean, if 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 anyone has to add um, to this, please feel free to do so. But we only have two more minutes left, and and we also want to have a a, a quick wrap up and outlook to the ne to next week's session. But um, let's see. Um, yeah, I think this this optimistic view is is one side of the problem. Uh, but when you were talking about how we all lead a much happier life without a car, I don't have a car either, or without eating meat, um, these are win win situations. We are healthier and happier without cars. But that's a city dweller perspective, right? As soon as you go outside the cities, people will say, we, we need cars. We, we cannot do without transportation and we cannot take the bus if we have to transport our goods from A to B. So uh, the, the perspective I would like to add to this optimistic view on technology and on, on social development and rising awareness is nevertheless, there are also tragic conflicts, one of which is the question of generational justice. There is no easy solution to that. And the bigger one that we also discussed is the question of economic justice or developmental 
uh, justice that does not have an easy answer. So we also do have kind of tragic conflicts that are um, for the time being really hard to solve. And I think we have to take this side of the thing also seriously. Thank you so much. And is there one last comment from the panelists? Otherwise, uh, no, perfect. So we can almost keep the time. Um, I would just want to thank you, um, Martin and I, see we sit in the same room here, <laughs> um, for all your contributions. And uh, next week we have another interesting lecture coming up with new guests. Um, we will have a little bit of a different format. Next week we have four speakers with a question and answer session. So there will be no panel next week, but also a double lecture. And we look forward to see you next week and to learn more about the topic. And with that, I wish you all a relaxed and happy evening. And thank you very, very much for your contributions. Thank you very much for being here. Bye. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.